Is that better? Yeah. Good. Okay. My name is Sue Ann Martinson, and I am with the WAM Media Committee, who's sponsoring this program tonight. And our media committee members, Polly Mann and Lee Ross, are here tonight. Bill Sorum, uh, who's also, you may know him from his work with the uptake, but he is a member of the WAM Media Committee, and he's unable to join us. But I want to just say welcome. Thank you for coming. And I'm going to just turn it right over to Don. Well, the uh, first thing I should say that Lydia Howe will not be here tonight. She is uh, having to have a, has a landlord hassle, so that uh, no. she's otherwise occupied. But I thought, uh, uh, as an introduction, of course, is that we all are uh, so dependent upon the media because uh, none of us can know the whole world, so we depend upon other uh, entities for uh, funneling this information towards us. And all of us, have, especially if you're in this room, have had this kind of epiphany when you have said, I'm being lied to. <laughs> and then you started this lifetime quest of trying to understand the world from a different point of view than the mainstream media, if I may use that term, to describe what's, what's going on in the world. We, we, you know, and here I was going to go into the State Department, I was going to been out to the National Security Agency, I was going to have a government job, and I thought because I was going to help the world become a better place. Well, little did I know that uh, uh, we would have a difference of opinion and, and develop as I started to learn more about history, and I started to read these magazines like Ramparts and, you know, and, and these other points of view, which, whoa, whoa, that kind of like spun my head all around, and I'm sure we've all gone through that. And all of us go through uh, these various things. And, uh, um, and so it's, it was interesting when the 60s, as I was waking up, the, uh, that the, 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 the way the media was constructed then, these large newspapers, and then this underground press, we called it, we developed, and we got more and more uh, uh, things that we developed. The 100 Flowers was very big during the 60s with Eddie Feline, and with the Northern Sun, uh, Alliance, we had the Northern Sun News, we put out 10,000 copies every month, and we really got into a lot of different issues. And uh, in 1978, KFAI crawled its way onto the scene over the uh, direct uh, road blocking by Bill Kling and Minnesota Public Radio. They've done everything they can stab every potential radio across the across the state of Minnesota and sometimes even in, in other countries. So what I would like to say is that uh, we all put the world together differently. Uh, when we, we had this thing together, uh, talking about these things, getting our brains loosened up on this topic uh, a couple Sundays ago, Lee Ross says she, she doesn't like Z Magazine because she doesn't like the writing, but she loves the writing in Harper's, whereas me, I love the political content of Z Magazine, and I, li I like the uh, writing in the Harper's, but I always, I'm always i left with this kind of a dull feeling that, it, that I don't have that kind of like this movement thing. So she's, but, well, but we put the world together differently. We all, we all look at it differently. So the, the good, the good, uh, having a uh, healthy uh, 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 news media, a news diet, it depends upon having a variety of different things and people being open for looking at different things. And I think being part of this community that we have here is that we're willing to kind of like educate each other, inform each other, and working. Because the, the more we can kind of like get our ideas out there, the better chance we can have of achieving this uh, uh, peace and social justice, this new kind of society that we all want to overcome all these isms which are getting in our way. But the world is fast changing. We've got the internet that Dan's going to be talking about. And we've got now this, the two biggest publishers, Random House, Humongous, is going to be combining with Penguin Publishers. I mean, they're all, but all of it is based upon how can certain groups of people become rich and how can they influence the world. And, and, and so we're all trying not to be pawns in this uh, world, but how do we, uh, how do we, make the changes, how do we have our own media, and how do we reach other people out there. And one last thing I'll say, when I was in graduate school, 
I learned in my media, my media class is that only 10% really want to know what's going on in the world. That may have changed now, but let's say it is true. And that the rest of us, they depend on other people that they, you know, they have friends with and that they think that are going to teach them things. So that's part of what we all do in our lives. So now I'm going to be introducing some of the other people here. We're going to have a, a John Slade, who is uh, involved with the founding of the Twin Cities in the media and the Counter Propaganda Coalition. He was also a part of the Free Radio Twin Cities, and he is currently community organizer of the Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity. And, uh, and we'll also be having next to me here is Dan Fight. Dan is a Minneapolis web developer and journalist, former reporter at the Minneapolis State Capitol. He volunteers with Twin Cities in the Media and supported the live video production for Occupy Wall Street with GlobalRevolution.tv since the day it started. He's a blogger and he'll tell you about a lot more stuff. But uh, John, why don't you talk about media ownership and, and consolidation? <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And, and uh, I'd like to give a huge thanks to Women Against Military Madness and everybody for the wonderful turnout tonight and the opportunity to be here on the panel. Um, freedom of the press is guaranteed only to one, those who own one. That was a quote by a bunch of people, Mark Twain, A.J. Liebling, Henry Mencken. Um, and in America, the um, media model has been uh, really influenced by capitalism, by American capitalism. Um, you can take a look at a lot of what went down in American media, particularly the broadcast media, um, and take a look at what happened to radio in the 1930s. So uh, in, you may be familiar with the term BBC One, and the reason that that's the case is that in uh, England, uh, during the 30s, when uh, radio was first kind of hitting the world, and people realized that there was only so much space on the dial, and so that spectrum needed to be allocated somehow. Um, most every country that was got radio at the time said, okay, we're gonna take most of the spectrum, or all of the spectrum, um, for uh, state media. Um, and uh, in America, the reverse was true. We've got the left of the dial, where you can find, uh, you used to be able to find all of your educational uh, and other kinds of, uh, of radio stations. And then everything else was uh, given to uh, commercial media. Um, and uh, the, the phrase that uh, when we were starting the Twin Cities Indian Media chapter and, uh, is corporate media. Um, and that's kind of one of, the, one of the big things to keep track of. Um, I kind of came of age, um, came of age. Um, I started paying attention to politics really early. I was six or seven when Watergate happened. And so the, the phrase that I took from my earliest days was follow the money. So let's take a look at what's happened with money uh, in uh, media ownership. Um, basically, <clears throat> um, for many years, um, the, uh, well, uh, so in the 30s, it was it, the, the radio dial went mostly commercial. Um, there were still some stations. There was a big station in, in uh, uh, Chicago that the labor unions controlled. Um, but by and large, the media diet that everybody had access to was uh, for and by um, people who were making money by selling ads. Um, in the 50s and 60s, we had the domination of TV, the new uh, medium, by the big three. Um, and so they were able to kind of get to a cartel situation where, yes, there was public television, but CBS, NBC, and ABC were kind of able to, you know, get, get together in New York, and they hang out at the same parties, and you had the same kind of limited uh, uh, perception and, and, and of stuff. Um, then in the uh, 70s and 80s, deregulation happened. Our good friend Ronald Reagan uh, was the first to take a big ax to the FCC's media ownership rules. Um, he did a number of things. First off, the idea of the fairness doctrine, um, which, uh, as I can see that uh, we've got a, a goodly chunk of, of revered elders here. You might remember what it was like before the fairness doctrine was thrown out. I barely do. But the idea that you had, if on, on an issue, that you had to have both sides, that got tossed out, which leads directly to Rush Limbaugh and uh, Fox News. Um, you also had the beginnings of the deregulation of ownership. So it was set up in the day that you couldn't have a radio station owned by the same people that had a TV station with, by the same people that had a newspaper. Um, you could only have so many outlets and so many markets because the people that set up the rules were very aware that, uh, how, well, 
you know, information is power, and power corrupts, and if you, if you get too much information in the hands of too few people, there's a huge potential for corruption and for abuse. Um, so uh, the, uh, the Reagan uh, years started that. Um, back about then, uh, you, you could talk about the 100 top media companies. Um, so during the Reagan years, um, and it was, it, frankly, it was um, faster during Republican administrations, slower during Democratic administrations, but still the overall trend was consolidation, 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 continuing deregulation. Um, the uh, big, big block happened uh, right at the end of the Bush administration. Um, the Bush FCC was going to uh, do a, another big uh, deregulation and allow things that basically would have let, uh, t like the Twin Cities, two companies could have owned the media. Um, it already had gotten to the point where, as I said, at one point you could talk about the 100 top media companies. Now you really talk about the top five, the top seven. Um, uh, and in terms, I mean, ABC, uh, well, <clears throat> and we have some of the, some of the flyers that talk about, you know, exactly who they are, Disney, uh, Clear Channel, um, and right for abuse. Um, one example, uh, after the radio station deregulation got thrown out, um, and you used to only be able to own something like 25 to 50 stations nationwide, that gets thrown out, Clear Channel, Cumulus show up. So it's 9-11. And the Dixie Chicks have the temerity to say something to their country music audience about how they, they're maybe not fully supporting the president. Well, uh, one guy at, uh, at, uh, at uh, I think it was Cumulus, um, it was the radio station, says the Dixie Chicks are off, and they pull the Dixie Chicks off the air in hundreds of, in, uh, hundreds of stations across the country. Um, in the case, uh, also after 9-11, um, they started, uh, they came out with a list of uh, radio songs that you might not want to be playing. It came out of the Western Division of Clear Channel Communication, which owns about 1,500 radio stations nationwide. And it got circulated throughout the industry. So everything by the band Rage Against the Machine, uh, Rocket Man by, um, by uh, Elton John, um, uh, Imagine by John Lennon. Um, all of these songs, you know, were deemed by somebody in an office, somebody in a corporate office who's following, you know, the, the will of his corporate leaders, um, is, is able to, uh, to cut that off. Um, and this is, and I'll be talking a little bit about this uh, in the next section, um, about why we get a, quote, free media that acts like a state media. And that's kind of what we're one of the things that we're talking about. Why is it that on almost every channel that you look at, and by channel I mean internet, radio, TV, any any avenue of getting information, you find it dominated by the same limited discourse, the same corporate. Um, there are two allowable positions: the far right and the right of center, and that's the only allowable positions that you can have if you've got that. Um, and a big chunk of that <clears throat> was the ownership and the consolidation. Um, as it stands right now, there's about three radio uh, companies in the Twin Cities that own most of the radio stations. Um, there are the Star Tribune and the Pioneer Press. We are rare in still having two daily newspapers. Um, although, if any longtime readers are aware that there's not a whole lot of difference between those two, um, we uh, have uh, uh, TV, and that's you know pretty much the same thing. Um, freedom of the press belongs to those that own the press, and we'll be talking a little bit more about the new technologies. Basically, there's two, desktop publishing uh, and the ability of the use of the internet to distribute information. Those two allowed people to break through in areas where you used to have a lot of money to compete. Um, but, um, so, uh, and those channels are under huge pressures to be controlled again, and I think that uh, Dan's going to be talking um, a lot more about that. Um, but who owns the media, what the media are owned by, the reason that KFAI is so important, uh, the reason that Minnesota Public Radio should be so important and it doesn't and it pisses me off is because it is got a level of public ownership, although um, if you look at Lando, I mean, Lando Lakes is a co-op. You know, it was far, formed in the co-op movement of the 30s, and it is now acting just like a corporation. 
um, Minnesota Public Radio acts now as the center right edge of the of the condition or the what do I want to say traditional the accepted media. Um, so uh, consolidation has happened. Um, the Obama administration came in with folks saying, "Oh, we're going to do something about consolidation," but like a lot of other things, um, not a whole lot of more evil has happened, at least on the ownership front. Um, I think that I'm a little behind the scenes on the internet front. Um, but it's just, these are all um, important issues to see who owns the press. And that's important why we need to have publicly owned, we need to have nonprofit media outlets, we need to have small players, and the blogging world is an example of small players. But we also need to have good ground rules so that you can be a small player on the internet and still access people. Um, we need to have low power FM, we need to have more outlets instead of less. And frankly, we need uh, some new antitrust le legislation to break up those big media monopolies. And probably a return to the fairness doctrine would be a really fine idea as well. Um, so uh, now we are in, um, we've got uh, some time for my fellow panelists um, or other folks to talk about media ownership and consolidation. Dan, Dan? Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Dan Veit, and uh, I want to you know, thank Wham and everyone for having me here on the panel. Um, so uh, I um, worked from 2005 to 2009 at a place called Politics in Minnesota, politicsinminnesota.com. Uh, my publisher was Sarah Janicek, and it went while I was there from being a independent news organization to being bought out by a media corporation called Dolan Media. And uh, I think that that experience was a great example of the dynamics of consolidation. Um, because what happens is that whether it's FCC licensing on the frequencies or the regulation of internet traffic or certain systems of subsidies, uh, media organizations swim within uh, basically legal statutes that effectively make them kind of state subsidized. And so we know that you know, the FCC makes sure that nobody else can jump on you know, uh, cool 108's frequency and that kind of thing, right? But um, when I worked at Politics in Minnesota, that was really tough because it is really hard to pull in revenue in any media organization. And so what ended up, what, what happened to us was we were you know, struggling along, just pulling in little bits of subscriber revenue from weekly newsletters and stuff, and a little bit of advertising on the web. And we could see that Dolan Media had actually rigged up a very clever business model. Only it took us a while to figure out exactly how clever it was. But um, there's actually a system of statutes in every state called public notice publishing statutes, which basically say if you have a legally qualified public newspaper that has a circulation of at least uh, 500 paper copies sold that, and at least a minimum uh, percentage of original content, that then um, when, uh, essentially when different bureaucratic things happen, people have to buy classifieds in your newspaper. And what that ends up creating is a huge subsidy. And so what Dolan Media did was they put newspapers in all these different like state capitals and county seats so that um, in particular when banks foreclose on a house, people have to buy, the banks buy these classifieds. And so they were literally just raking in money like hand over fist on these public notice classifieds across their entire network. Now today, if you actually look at Dolan Media's stock filings, um, they make more than half of their revenue from actually processing mortgage defaults. Like they are actually doing the back office work on foreclosure now because the classifieds just weren't lucrative enough, right? So it's like, how do you build like an independent news organization that isn't getting those subsidies? How do you avoid getting balled up into the Borg collective of a subsidized media structure? I think that that's um, the question which we found, you know, we got, we all got, we got swallowed up by. Um, so I think to propose a positive replacement for this system, which um, I don't think is very fair, it doesn't really distribute media subsidies very widely at all, I think instead, if we said that, uh, you know, we could go to the legislature and say, um, let's make it so that uh, things that have to be published, that people need to know about, should be published on the internet, and then anybody that keeps that posting on the internet for like two years gets a little trickle of payments over that entire two year period, regardless of what they are, if they're a profit, non-profit, ideology, media, whatever, as long as they're locally based, they could get 
uh, some share of these payments instead of these big media corporations. I think that was that. So that's my suggestion for a positive, like, alternative to this system. So I think, um, yeah, it was just very personal to see how this subsidy system they were so bent on let them swallow us up as an independent organization. So I just wanted to throw that one in there. One of the things I uh, feel lucky about is that I'm able to make uh, my living from uh, doing something I think is a good thing. Namely, I distribute uh, magazines, many of whom are alternative, many of, many of whom are very micro. So I, you, you can have some of the best uh, information, but it's got to get out to people. Now, in some ways, it's a dying form of, uh, of, of having information. The printed word is even though this is what I prefer, more and more people are not buying them on the newsstand, more and more people are only you know, getting the uh, internet versions of them. And it, in all throughout the, uh, say, the magazine world, there's been this huge consolidation. There is this, I'm what's called an alternative distributor. There's a few of us around the country that do a lot of the kind of things I do, some of the alternative magazines as well as some, some, some of the other ones uh, do bigger ones. But then there were the big guys on top that do all the, you know, the Time, the Newsweek, but the Mademoiselle, the Cosmos. Cosmos is the most important magazine that's sold at the University of Minnesota. Did I say important, the most popular? So uh, that shows you. So, uh, but, but, you know, there was a time when there were the, of these big guys, there used to be 300. Now there's down to about five. Mm. And so it's, there's been tremendous consolidation that is going on there. And there's con tremendous contraction of a lot of the uh, ones that I do because uh, for a variety of reasons. One, there's the venues for people to buy them. You know, subscriptions are always out there and they, they, they do it mightily. I mean, Harper's Magazine, they make them very cheap. They just about pay you to take all of them. They'll do everything they can because they... The advertising is what, what does it. But what's happened here, like, you know, when I started as a magazine distributor in 1980, after these other people had tried to do the same sort of thing, they all failed. And, uh, but I did it just, you know, hard work, and I like to do it. I feel it's my mission. But it's, uh, we used to have, like, the, this used to be the number one place for independent bookstores. Now they've been wiped out by Amazon. They've been wiped out by the Barnes and Nobles. They've been, you know, the Borders, which itself has been wiped out. They've it's gone from the scene. So it's a tremendous consolidation, and it's a, 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 a lot of the magazines. I mean, I keep putting them out there, but they're getting thinner and thinner and thinner uh, as as they hang on. And some of them have disappeared, and some of the some of the magazines have combined. Maybe they should. Maybe there's too many of them that, that do it, but you know, they reflect a certain point of view and. So I, I like to put them out there. I like to uh, I learn a lot from these, and I use them in my in my, in my uh, radio show that I do, which I started at the same time at Berkeley in 1980. It was kind of a pivotal pivotal, uh, pivotal year for me. I talked about the consolidation of uh, in the book world, and, and it's all of a part there. Now, for a long time, the Amazon we used to wonder about the internet. How about how can you uh, how can you make money? Well, eventually. These good capitalists figure out how to do it, and they've how, they figured out how to put the squeeze and destroy their competition, which is the nature of the capitalist beast. You know, they, you can have very entrepreneurial, you can do all these things, but basically, it's a uh, it's a war out there, and they're trying to kick, you know kill you off before you kill them off. And there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of these big guys, they circle around, you know, they. Oh, no, yeah, we know you like Don Olson as a distributor, but wouldn't you really rather to get the magazines from me? This, is, this happens all the time. So, but, you know, because I give local good service, then that's my, my entree, my whatever it has, it, it, it keeps it going. And, you know, how long will I keep it going? I don't know. It's, uh, I still like doing it, but maybe somebody will want to take over, but then I think, boy, boy, so many of the younger people, they're not so much involved or they don't, Printed matter is now what really gets their juices flowing. Well, um, just looking at, uh, you know, since we're doing a, a pretty good anti-capitalist critique of our media, which is a good place to start in America, um, there's two concepts. Vertical integration, um, which is that, you know, in the old days it was you, uh, you know, you own the oil well, you own the gas station, you own the, the um, 
the processing facility. Um, in media, it, it's, it's you own the production companies. And this was actually, Al Franken um, has gone on at great length about this when the networks uh, were allowed to own their own content creation. Um, and so you've got these big five media giants that are doing that and they have everything from, you know, you, the production of the content to the distribution and, and everything in between. So that vertical integration is a really important concept. The other concept is a, a concept of a cartel, which is to say it's not a monopoly, it's not a single actor necessarily, but it's a small enough group of actors that all have the same philosophies and they all, you know, share interlocking boards. And um, I'm, I'm <clears throat> uh, not a fan of the, I think that you don't need the Trilateral Commission, all you need is Davos, all you need is a place for the rich to get together and to kind of talk about how they're doing things and just to touch base that they're still agreed that you never let a socialist or an anarchist on the real socialist or anarchist on the radio or TV and that's enough of a control mechanism you don't need the you know the Illuminati necessarily doing it um, so those those are two concepts and Dan handle another yeah. oh I just wanted to quickly mention another uh, subsidy framework that people don't really widely know about you know, uh, in the early days in the United States, um, the U.S. actually subsidized its postal service more than national defense because these Benjamin Franklin type guys believed it was important for all these pamphlets to be able to circulate cheaply, and that was a very important thing. And unfortunately, what's happened is that the, the big lobby, the people that publish Time Magazine and everything, they actually uh, aggressively lobbied Congress to change the pricing structure that is imposed on the post office. The post office has a lot of weird rules put on it, like they can't ship wine and stuff. And so they're kind of going under because of these funny rules. But one of them just makes it easier for Time Magazine to be set out as cheaply as possible, but smaller circulation newsletters essentially get priced out. So that is another uh, example of a subsidy system like the public notice uh, subsidy system that uh, you know, helps uh, that structure consolidate. And I just wanted to mention too, um, for a little while my boss had a show at Clear Channel and so um, I was able to go down to the studio where they do KTLK. I got to actually see into like the thing that loads the music and there were actually, you know, you hear Cities 97, you think they play a lot of Counting Crows. Their whole system actually only had six Counting Crows songs in it, which I was surprised by. <laughs> That was just me, but um, uh, but it was amazing to see how all these different little radio stations were just little rooms in this one clear channel headquarters place out on 394, and uh, that just illustrated to me how clear channel whew, just sort of boils everything down, you know, lay everybody off, borrow a ton of money that's you know created electronically by the Federal Reserve, and then they could just you know buy up all these stations and fire everyone. So yeah, th those are the systems, I guess. And uh, I think next we'll move on to John. Uh, is also going to uh, kick things off uh, the topic of gatekeeping. All right, gatekeeping, how you keep the uh, barbarians from overrunning the stockade, um, or in this case, the actual real citizens' democracy from upsetting the 1% system. Um, on most of your uh, chairs, there was a uh, sheet labeled Counter Propaganda Coalition Fact Sheet Number 2 how the mainstream media fail us. It's yellow, uh, and it's got a thing on it called the propaganda model. Um, and uh, this is, you know, kind of the, why does the corporate media act like a state media? Um, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman put together this model um, in the 70s, um, and I think it's just so important that it's probably a good idea to go over it. The first thing is that our system runs by and is based on money and ownership. Um, once again, follow the money. Um, and so these are these are filtering systems that take, and you can you can kind of, we've got it here set up as there's raw news, there's the things that are happening out there in the world today. Um, and so the first thing that happens is, okay, here's money. So in order to get, uh, you know, onto cable news, you need a ton of money. Um, in order to get on regular news, you need a ton of money. You can get onto public news, public TV, a little bit, little tiny thing, stuck in the corner, not really great. KFAI, for instance, you know, we've, we've, uh, we're public radio, but we've got a limited, you know, you can't go down to the suburbs and get them. Um, and so the, uh, the wealth and the, uh, there's a huge amount of uh, money that's required to get your news out and to get that ownership out there. Um, the, um, there's been a, a bunch of, there's a, a really great book, it's Sue Ann. Uh, we did a, 
uh, a cable TV show, um, and we were, uh, was that McChesney's book? Yes. Um, and uh, he was basically saying that one of the big myths about American media is that they don't have interests. And they have interests. They so have interests. Um, they want Wall Street to continue. They want this system to go on. They are part and parcel of that system, and it shows in what they show. If you challenge it too directly, you are going to find that you run into all sorts of blockades. Um, the other big one, and this is another follow the money, is its advertising revenue. Um, and the uh, uh, and we're in the, okay, maybe Minnesota, if the Romney people have their way, is going to be considered to be a state that's in play in the presidential election. From what I gather, places, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, um, have been seeing nothing but political ads due to Citizens United, due to uh, a ton of other, you know, pro-money decisions that have been coming down. Um, and that means that all of this spending has been going on. Uh, there's two effects of that. First off is negative, uh, it, it's, it's to suppress votes. Negative advertising is generally there to suppress votes, not increase them. Um, and secondly, people say, oh, these guys, you know, okay, how much ad spending did the Green Party do? How much did the Justice Party do? How much did the Constitution Party do? Or the Libertarians? Not so much. Democrats, Republicans, and their friends, huge amount. And people are aware of that and follow where the money goes. Filter three, reliance on selective information. That's kind of the golden Rolodex. You find the same people quoted all the time. Um, it's easier. Um, and uh, this is actually where, um, you know, I have to say not every corporate media outlet person is doing a bad job. A lot of them go into it because they feel that as a democracy we need good information and they're playing an important role in, in a democratic society. Um, but they also find that, like my mother who worked for the Winona Daily News as a feature writer and was told by her editor, we write features on our advertisers. That's back to filter two advertising. Um, but uh, reliance on selective information, and it's, it's just easier. They don't have much time to do it. The, the staff has been cut. When you want something happens bad on the north side, you go to the same people again and again. Um, and you trim, and, and those people get trimmed. That's number four. Flack or is the system of pushing back. Uh, the idea that there is a liberal media out there, um, which I think is total BS. There's a corporate media out there. Um, but the pushing that the far right, the right and the far right have done, saying there is a liberal media, it is a liberal media, um, is because they're pressuring the media to be more right wing. They say you're too far to the left, even though they're pretty far to the right, but that just pushes them farther to the right. Uh, they have lawyers, they have the ability to do advertising boycotts, um, and so that's another thing. We can, usins, um, can do flack back again, we can push back, and the internet has made it possible for people to organize boycott campaigns. Rush Limbaugh, frankly, is uh, has been under a really serious boycott campaign for a while, and he is actually getting pushed off a lot of stations and is dropping a lot of adver advertisers. The fifth filter, um, it, we, it's labeled here as anti-terrorism. When Chomsky and Herman came out, it was anti-communism, which is when, when it all else fails, you just say, you can't listen to them because they're X. And X is whatever the enemy of the day is. And that's why, you know, and I remember when the Soviet Union went down, I'm like, oh, you know, what's gonna be, you know, war is the, war is the health of the state. That's one of my other favorite slogans. Who, who is gonna be the enemy that we have to be afraid of, that we have to be boogeyman about? Um, and so uh, that's one of the reasons that the campaign against Islam is so important for the far right and for the state is because you have to have the boogeyman to scare people off on. And if you looked at the reporting that was going on on this, a couple trials of Somali folk, the judge in Rochester saying that this guy was a threat to society because he helped some people send some money to what was a, really the, basically the same thing as the support of the IRA in Ireland is the support, that's, that's the Somali terror stuff. It's two sides fighting back home and one side is getting money sent back to them. It's not terror that will shake Wall Street at its roots. Anyway, so that's the uh, filter system and that's, that gives us um, this. So that's some of the ideas about gatekeeping and I know that there are folks here who want to talk about third party gatekeeping as well. Oh yeah.
Um, yeah, and all, by the way, I think we're gonna have like 30 minutes for questions at the end too. So yes. we'll have a good, nice two-way discussion later. Um, I just wanted to kind of point out sort of a, a technical aspect of media production and you know what constitutes gatekeeping. The thing is like, you know, let's say, uh, you know, I'm at a protest, I get, you know, an hour of video um, and I have to try to make a, a, a segment out of it, like maybe three minutes, five minutes, whatever. And I tell you, one of the fundamental things you end up doing when you're doing media work is you have a timeline on the video editor in front of you and you hit the delete key. And when you do that, like you're essentially functionally acting as a gatekeeper in some way. You're sort of taking the totality of the reality and slimming it down to a narrower chunk and then putting that chunk out there and setting the other stuff aside. And so that so because there's no way necessarily to turn everything around in its totality. I mean, and one of the nice things about live streaming video, like we're live on the internet right now, um, is at least like that's not edited, like at least it's in line with the time it's actually happening. However, it's pointed over here and it's not pointed over there. So it's not like representing 360 around us. So gatekeeping is always something that kind of happens in the process or something like gatekeeping always happens in the process of media creation, but what ends up happening is that essentially editors um, are supposed to sort of have an implicit understanding from their publishers about what they should be emphasizing. So like when I worked at Politics in Minnesota, I was I was supposed to basically find stories that the majors were not looking at and get those out there. And But so in a sense, like I already had a gatekeeping of not covering the stuff that was already being covered, for example. And so you're just sort of expected to do that. And so that that's sort of a functional thing that happens in the media. But also there's a problem where um, when stories are important or uh, they're sort of hard to uh, nail down onto a good foundation, um, what can happen is that it's really hard to get even, you know, decent alternative people to address those things. And I think uh, um, a good example to look at actually, um, I, I know a few people that uh, uh, talked with directly who were essentially whistleblowers about September 11th. We have Colleen Rowley in the back. <laughs> We, and I also um, talked to a couple other ones, and so uh, there's a woman named Susan Lindauer who was a CIA asset before 9-11, and a bunch of weird stuff happened to her, and she took her whole story to Amy Goodman and was kind of counting on Goodman to get the story out, and Goodman never really did that, and so there's bitterness that, like, oh, she's a left gatekeeper, you know, and, um, and then so it's a concern that this kind of thing happens. It's like, you know, for example, uh, MinPost, right, gets a lot of money from sort of foundation grants and stuff, and so you know, hypothetical example, if they get a lot of money from the Blandin Foundation, are they really going to confront the role that Blandin Paper has of chopping all the trees down up north, <laughs> you know? So, um, but, but the, the way to resolve the problem with the fact that Amy Goodman, Amy Goodman didn't cover Susan Lindauer is to say, well, we need more teams of reporters that have the capacity to do that, because there's just this, like, lack of capacity. It's like if there were five different programs like Democracy Now! going on, chances are it would have landed on one of them. So we can't necessarily point the finger at people for like failing to cover a story when we really lack enough people to cover all the stories. And I think that's a major like component of it, but I think it's a good example of that kind of dynamic going on. So. I don't know if I have anything more to add. I could talk about more things, but essentially we got the ideas out about gatekeeping and uh, and all of us would like uh, democracy now to do certain things. Some people have referred to the way the coverage of uh, Libya and now Syria as being, uh, but you know, the sort of maybe they, you know, possibly they don't have any good uh, people that they could have a, a counter viewpoint on. Uh, m many of the people uh, in our orbit there were, were very concerned about what was going on in Yugoslavia. But there they had Jer there we had Jeremy Scahill, who was like this from the grassroots radio. And he was over there, and he just did this fantastic reporting. So, uh, you know, it's uh, surprisingly, Democracy Now! is like 14 people, I said, well, or something like that. I saw a, uh, a postcard, a Christmas card that was sent to, and somebody showed it to me. And so there's a lot of uh, wheels of motion, and they have expanded enormously. That there, there is the best thing we've got going, and I learned a tremendous amount, and uh, Dennis uh, nice. Neistrad, who I uh, worked with closely when we fought off the corporatos who wanted to destroy uh, uh, Pacifica, uh, they've, they've expanded it all throughout the country. There are you know, over 800. Think of it, 800 different stations are carrying democracy now. That's, that's very good. 
But there's always people who will complain, and there are things people should always complain. I mean, I know some people just put their nose way up in the air, and that's fine. But I still learn a lot from them. I think the stuff on 9-11 was pretty pathetic. But still, besides that, we all, we all have our opinions on that. But uh, maybe we should uh, go on next to uh, Dan. You're going to do uh, on the internet, which uh, I try and avoid, but Dan is there. <laughs> He's for there for all of us. <laughs> Well, you might have the right idea. We'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think uh, with the difficulty of you know trying to come up with the expense of owning like a printing press or the affordable FCC licenses that are so easy to get, right? Uh, you know, people that have turned to this uh, crazy computer network that was invented by DARPA in the late '60s and '70s. And, and frankly, if you look at uh, the fact the internet still works after this huge storm on the East Coast, shows that the decentralized system technically functions well in disasters, which is what it was always supposed to do. Um, so th there's a lot of different ways you can you know, send information across the internet. And I think also um, another thing too is that it can be used to kind of um, fling information in and out of the internet, like actually uh, being able to reach people through text messaging on phones if they don't have the privilege of um, being able to have a full computer access. That's one of the important kind of um, bridges or glue between different mediums, which is actually really important. The, the tough thing, like there's a huge digital divide um, with internet access, and a lot of that has to do with FCC regulation too. Like, I cannot uh, resell my Comcast connection to my entire uh, apartment building without violating my terms of service, even though I never use it to capacity. So there's a lot of problems with the limitation of internet access um, in the United States that I think are really harmful. Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, I did uh, put together a real a quick little guide. Uh, it says, uh, be the media, independent media tips and tools. Um, it's a little uh, technical, so um, this might not be everyone's cup of tea, but there's a bunch of helpful stuff in there for everybody. Um, one thing uh, is that uh, it helps a lot if you can um, be able to follow a lot of websites at once without actually having to go and visit each one of them. And you can use a, a software called a RSS feed readers or feed readers. There's like Google Reader, and then I have a whole um, bunch of other ones like Mozilla Thunderbird uh, listed in that section. Um, another thing uh, is that I've been involved with a lot is uh, live video and doing uh, video off of cell phones and pushing that to the internet. And so um, for me, that kind of started, uh, there was one Friday night, uh, last September where my friends in New York were like, hey Dan, we're gonna be down at this Wall Street protest thing. Can you help run the live video feed? I was like, yeah, that sounds like an interesting little weekend project to like <laughs> remotely produce this thing for this protest. And then, you know, I was like, I was gonna be really impressed if they were still there by the next weekend. And then it like took off into this whole Occupy Wall Street thing. <laughs> and um, so, so live video uh, was very important actually to, to the growth of all of that because it, it involved, um, helping people take some more agency in their own lives. Like the, the media, uh, corporate media and the general system sort of works to make you a passive uh, non-participant in a spectacle. And I think part of what made the Occupy, I don't even know if movement is the right word so much as maybe cultural hack or twist, um, what made it uh, seem participatory and made people feel like they could identify with getting more agency in their own lives a live, live video that was really unproduced really had a lot to do with that. Um, and uh, so I think live video is very important. Um, and so we have some tech for that um, listed there. Um, also, uh, uh, chat software is important. I think um, one thing that our friends in Spain are finding is that uh, uh, corporate uh, providers like Google and Facebook give people's data over to the police very readily. And so that's a pretty big problem and it's getting worse, especially in other countries. And so um, we have to look at just being able to scramble chats to kind of make it so that people sitting in the middle, man in the middle, can't read what you're doing. Um, also, uh, video editing. I have some uh, free video editing software, which is finally maturing in the last couple of years that you can rig up. Uh, free uh, photo editing software, um, also uh, ways to kind of put notes together online so that everyone can kind of work jointly at the same time is really helpful. Collaborative writing processes um, work really well and they're really awesome. Um, then uh, there's also free software that you can use to set up your own websites. I think Facebook is kind of having almost an AOL sort of moment or decline, kind of like CompuServe, you know, is becoming, they're all running out of money because these messed up economics are always leading to declining ad revenue. And so Facebook is getting more and more exploitative, exploitative of, its, of its users. 
And so we got to start building new systems. Um, and so that's what we've been looking at. Uh, so uh, WordPress and uh, Drupal, which is what I do professionally, I develop Drupal sites, um, including we did a little work on KFAI's site. I, I got the podcasting working, which was tricky. <laughs> um, and then uh, so that that uh, building out these websites and then uh, connecting them using the RSS feeds. Uh, that's a way that you can create instead of being in one walled garden of a corporate provider, you can sort of create independent systems and then if you just have the logins essentially shared through a protocol called OpenID, um, the idea is that you don't have to count on one Facebook login or one Google login or one Twitter login. It can all kind of be shared and you don't have to be sort of a surf in one castle or estate. Um, I, I'm, real quick, uh, I uh, want to mention um, open licensing is another really important thing about across this whole movement. I think like goes back to kind of when indie media started and Creative Commons is a oppositional thing to copyright it, because intellectual property is this very aggressive social construction. It, it's a fake thing, you know? And, um, and these media corporations are essentially huge empires of intellectual property and Department of Homeland Security is getting into the enforcement of intellectual property and Creative Commons is the way that we build an open remix culture that actually matches how human minds and memes and ideas are actually shared instead of saying you don't own a DVD you just rent it so like you're just rent you're just here as a renter you know so I think all of that's really important um, and uh, I do I do recommend people get on Twitter actually believe it or not a lot of stuff goes around on Twitter very quickly it's actually a really effective use of time and also for the fine developers that you know and or people that are into computers and um, learn uh, version control software and free software is really important and it's called uh, Git is kind of the hot one it kind of comes from the Linux people and I really recommend that so I just wanted to give the quick rundown on all these different tech dimensions all right um, one of the things I wanted to talk about with the internet and like I said um, there is an opening that we've got now because it's new and because the old systems that were used by the rich and the powerful to corral our minds and get us into little boxes, they haven't yet figured out necessarily how to, to get their hands fully around the internet. Um, but um, the, uh, the content providers turning over names to police, that looking at stuff, um, I forget which it was, I think it was a Verizon at one point, um, a pro-choice organization was going to send a big text to everybody and Verizon said oh no 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 that can't go out on our text network because we're not about that we're not about controversy about things like that um, one of the things that I've been involved with a little bit in St. Paul is the advocacy of a municipally owned fiber optic bright fiber network um, and the idea is basically our highways should not be owned by the trucking companies um, because they'll just you know, if UPS owned the highways, you'd get only the good highways where UPS wanted them, and if you weren't there, it would be nothing. Uh, electrification, rural electrification, didn't happen until the New Deal and, and the government got into it. Having our, if we, if we took the money that we'd spent on that Viking stadium, we could have wired every single house and every single business in Minneapolis and St. Paul to the internet with a fiber optic cable to their door that would have given us basically about a, a 10 to 100 times faster service for probably half the cost. Or less. Or less. Um, and so, uh, the, and this is the old, you know, kind of old school, have the city do it because you, because you believe in democracy, you believe that governments can be a solution that pays attention to the people. You could also do it with like a co-op model but having some way to get the uh, internet connectivity out of the hands of Comcast and out of the hands of the uh, con of CenturyLink would be huge. And and hopefully hopefully you'll see me and other folks talking about that more, because Wall Street is going to fall because Goliath has gotten too big and cannot see the ground anymore. And the ground is shifting under Goliath's feet, and it's going to go down. And my hope is that it will go down without killing a lot of people, <laughs> basically. Um, you know, it's like, can we get a transformative revolution uh, that where we make demands of power and power gives up without starting a shooting war, which is its first usual uh, reaction. Anyway, Don? Um,
I guess I would just say, how would I add? I mean, I, I do have to go on the internet occasionally, but I do look at things, but you know, I don't find that it, my eyes get so tired so quickly. I prefer to talk with people face to face. I prefer to talk on the phone, preferably a landline, that uh, you know, a better sound, but also it saves a lot of time. You can tell the nuance of the voice and all that kind of thing. So that's what I like. And I don't find, so maybe I don't go to the right uh, websites, but they, they don't seem to be, they're just kind of like real quick one idea things. And it's, uh, but anyway, it's, it, but we have to look at too how popular YouTube is. If Lydia was here, she'd tell you the story about she just joined and got on there and the travails and this and that and having to do this and that. And what, what you have to uh, put on there. But there's a very good program last Sunday on on the media that uh, Minnesota Public Radio takes from uh, NY, uh, NYC, WNYC in New York City that bazillions of people around this world are so needing to have this YouTube as a way of relating to each other, especially young people. So there's there's something that's going on there that they really need to, that they find this of use, that they find this of, uh, of something that they are, are fine, are, whatever it is, is occupying a lot of their time and they, they're doing a lot of it. So it, it is something and that people do like doing it. I think uh, Sue Ann could talk about too, that she has a, a blog there, a website that she works on, uh, on YouTube. And so there's, uh, people are working on it and trying to do things and maybe we'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, yeah, and I just want to add too that uh, it, it's not out of the realm of possibility to build your own clone of YouTube. You may not have like the user base, but you can make systems that you post a large video file into and it recompresses them into a smaller file and makes a little page for each one. That, you can do that. It's, it's not actually as hard as you might think. Um, and, and so I, I think um, the overall sort of significance of the internet, I think, um, it gives us a sort of a way to handle, to grapple with the problems in our society um, along the lines of something that uh, one theorist calls an open source intelligence sort of network. And so open source intelligence is uh, a, a way that uh, in kind of this in intel community sort of theory is the opposite of secrets that are held. It's like information that's out there that's not secret, but it just may not be organized enough for you to find. But uh, this guy Robert Steele, who actually has a great new book called Open Source Everything that just came out a couple months ago, really good. Um, points out like essentially 90% of what policymakers need to have including like Marine General Anthony Zinni like 90% of that is not secret at all but we have this intelligence community world that is doing all these huge piles of secret ridiculous things and burning huge amounts of money with virtually nothing to show for it when in reality with a tiny fraction of that money if they just took in everything and published it publicly for everyone to kind of share and understand that could solve things at like the governmental and the civil and the commercial and industrial, you know, every level. And so what's nice when you kind of create sort of like a Twitter community, like I really helped kind of build that up around the state capital while I was there, getting all these people on Twitter, building a Twitter aggregator so other people could look at everything kind of, um, that created a really nice, really instant, very up to the minute kind of uh, open source network, open source intelligence network that could let everybody kind of get a real sense of where the political flow was at a given time. And so I think an activist uh, world doing sort of Occupy type stuff and sort of uh, globe spanning stuff like with Global Revolution TV, we cover stuff going on in Europe as well as North America, South America, um, a, a little bit in Africa, but you know, Africa's not that wired, so it's hard to reach. Um, but uh, basically the, the internet in these different modes serves that kind of open source approach. It does let you share that kind of information. It gets the heck like spammed out of it. Like they tend to just make bigger haystacks just when we think we're getting to the needles. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I really think like that's kind of the uh, theoretical <laughs> kernel that like can make it actually make have a real positive difference in the way that all of us live our lives. And uh, uh, Dan, have you already gotten into how to build alternatives, or do you, how do you want to have that presentation? Um, yeah, I can talk about that. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I guess like I've been involved a lot with um, just yeah, sort of setting up different um, systems like uh, uh, with Global Revolution TV. Like we knew that um, the media was not, the regular media wasn't going to be very interested in covering a protest, you know. And so we first kind of worked out ourselves how to 
run a model of having live streaming people running around with like webcams, pushing them up to the internet, and then pulling those together, aggregating them, mixing them, trying to add some context, and then pushing them back out again. And then from working out ourselves, then we sort of described the model to everybody so that they could replicate it themselves and put their own team together in you know California or whatever to do the same thing. And so um, it, it takes a little bit of experimentation, a little bit of kind of going on the run, sort of, you know, I just, I just remember uh, when my friend Flux was like running around down on Wall Street and this computer kept, you know, messing up and all this stuff, it just didn't, it was barely working. And I saw someone comment on the chats, because this was, this was probably like the third or fourth day of Occupy Wall Street, and they were like, well, I know this is for real because this stuff barely works at all. <laughs> and if this was some big thing, everything would work perfectly, you know? <laughs> I, just, I always love that. Um, but yeah, so I think it, you just, you want to try to find ways to use free tools that are reproducible. And then um, it isn't necessarily that everyone has to like make new tools. You just have to kind of know how to glue them together. Um, and then, uh, you know, when we were setting up Occupy Wall Street Radio on uh, WBAI, the Pacifica flagship station, you know, same kind of thing. We were working with the uh, tools that we had, you know, sending people out there, getting audio clips, getting them posted, um, and, and, you know, opening up that sort of conversation. Like, um, there's a real sense with the establishment media that uh, the range of conversation is very narrow. I think when you listen to Minnesota Public Radio, um, you get a sense that it's only about like technocratic adjustments, never like about considering alternative futures that are significantly really that different, you know? <laughs> and, and so I think like uh, the, the trick is just setting up a space where people can A, find it, and then B, have like, you know, space pushed back for an open discussion. And when, I, when, you, when, when you can feel that really happening, it's just a really positive feeling. And I, for me, that's sort of what's motivated me to keep pushing and sort of keep pushing through the burnout, kind of. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I guess um, to, to build structure around obstacles, um, I think that uh, the software that I'm talking about here on the list, those are, are really good building blocks if you want to work on that kind of thing. And um, and yeah, I, and I think, it's, but it's, it's getting tough because it's like Facebook, <laughs> like you can't, you can only reach about 15%. If you have a fan page or whatever, uh, you post an update on it, it's only reaching 15% of the actual fans right now. Like that's actually, that's kind of shifted in the last year or so. And so, um, yeah, we just have to keep just pushing forward to building alternatives and then letting people know and then getting them trained and then having the trainers train people, you know, and train, 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 you know. It's, 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 it's tough, but I think um, with persistence we can make a difference, so. One of the things why I like uh, radio distribution, uh, radio uh, is that it's a people's uh, medium because it's cheap uh, to both to uh, set up in a sense that, that it isn't all that expensive, but also people to do it can just, you know, you can pay $15 for a, and have a uh, cassette recorder and you can listen to a lot of people. And the people around the world, they, a lot of people get their news from media. It's a real people's thing and it's a real good thing. And I, if I would say too, uh, as having a big, uh, being a news person, that a person who's uh, been doing this now for a while, is that uh, I think looking back, it was a good thing that I did organizing first, that you that you really start to see what it takes to make a movement. I was involved with the draft resistance, the anti-war movement during uh, Vietnam, and with uh, uranium mining, with the uh, f uh, farmers fighting the power line. I was out there. Uh, all the time and to do these kind of things because then you see what it takes to make really bring things about. And I think what uh, both I do and what Lydia says we want to do is to uh, have a way for people who are actually doing this organizing to get their voices out there. That we want to be, we call it, we used to call it the hour of people hour, now a people power. So now we have uh, two, uh, two hours. Uh, hour each on uh, Thursday and Friday from 9 to 10 a.m. And it's, uh, uh, we, we do have a lot of different things. I like to tape talks. I like the way the information that a person gives in a talk, that they're, they're pushing it out there, they're doing it, uh, they're, they've got it organized in a certain way. But I like to interview people too, and I do it a lot. And I, I like to interview uh, authors, a lot of them over the uh, uh, phone, they'll cover different topics that I might not normally do it. And plus I try, you know, would bring in new information into this area. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it takes a lot of time, but keeping everything together, doing a lot. We have uh, uh, things we have to get done for the station. It's uh, sometimes people have talked about wanting to get a show, but 
I mean, it's a really a lot of work. And plus, uh, I tell people that, you know, we always have our, KFI is almost unique in having a uh, listener access program called the WAVE Project. It's 10 a.m. on uh, Sunday morning, and you can sign up. And there's a lot of different people who get up there and they'll do their favorite music or their favorite topic of this or that, animals, this or that, all these different things. And so it's pretty wide open as long as the... Uh, you don't say the seven nasty words that the FCC is concerned about. It's pretty, uh, per pretty wide open and all that because then we could be fine. But it's uh, so we try and uh, do it with, uh, you know, we have a, an amalgam uh, in KFAI. We have an interesting thing between uh, music and news, but we have the twelve different languages. We have. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, music that's not elsewhere, but we have a lot of, uh, we've become a place where a lot of uh, new immigrant groups, the uh, people who have suffered through various empires, uh, uh, wars being fought uh, hither and yon, and they, uh, so often they, they leak into the metropolitan country, i.e. the U.S. So it's, uh, uh, we, we sometimes try and say that we try to be the cultural crossroads of the Twin Cities. That's always a big thing to do because it's a big thing, but this is something that we try to work on. And it's, uh, so I want to have all of you to think about it. And uh, if you have things that you want us to be announced, or if you want to get on there, I always like to also uh, have different people do it because until you get a microphone in front of you and learn how to organize your thoughts and say these things, it's, it's, it's not always as easy as it seems. In fact, sometimes, I've had people <laughs> freeze up. Well, you know, who knows what's going to happen? It's, it's you know, and uh, it, it, you know, you have these things, and you, you work with people, try and make them uh, uh, comfortable. And a lot of the people who are on there are old hands. They've done it a lot. They know what they're doing. They're they're getting things across. And so this is what we all want to try and do. So please, we have it as a we're our community uh, resource, and we want you to. Uh, use all these things and we are you know in some ways uh, struggling now because a lot of the young people they don't listen to radio they don't do a lot of you know literally when we had this play about the minnesota the, the peace crimes we, we talked to a lot of these people at the university they didn't have they didn't do the radio and they did their own mix of music well it's you know everything changes everything is different but it's 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 how you know we try and keep in mind how do we reach this uh realm of having peace and social justice, which I think is the basis. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about two things. The uh, creation of the, of, the, of the Indy Media Network. Um, so the Seattle WTO protests, which were basically organized through uh, email. Um, the new technology of email um, and the internet is what gave the groups that had been operating mostly on the West Coast the connectivity to be able to get together 15,000 people uh, on the street side and 30,000 people on the organized labor side and really run circles around the Seattle police for about three days. Um, and uh, so I was able to, and I'll talk about the group that got me there, um, I was able to, to be there um, for a day and a half, uh, the, the first day where uh, the uh, you know, forces of anti-capitalism took control of a major downtown during a major uh, world trade uh, party, and that was a lot of fun. Um, but uh, the, um, um, what happened was that the police um, basically rioted. They got really upset that they'd lost control of downtown Seattle. Um, and I always say that what happened that at the end of that day, was they pushed everybody from, if the protests had been in downtown Minneapolis, they pushed the whole protest about as far as uptown, um, and that's they pushed it up Capitol Hill, um, and then the residents of uptown got upset, and it kind of degraded, um, and so there was a lot of flashbang grenades going on, there was a lot of tear gas, but on the regular media, um, the chief of police and the mayor were saying that the police had shown admirable restraint and they hadn't used rubber bullets and they hadn't used tear gas much. But, um, and I can't come, I'm looking at that media after in my, you know, clothes are still smelling like tear gas. Um, and then I look at this great www.indymedia.org and there's a picture of a kid 
with a rubber bullet in his hand and he's lifting up his shirt and he's got a picture with three big welts on it where he got hit by the rubber bullets. Um, and so that was just a really transformative moment for me where I realized, as Don was saying, they're lying to us. And that's, and I gotta say, that's one of the things that people all across the world, and I think this is a great audience and you guys have been great, and I, I bet we'll get good questions, we should probably shut up soon. But, um, but people all across the country know that they're being lied to. They know that they're not getting the straight story, but they don't necessarily know how to process that or where to go for something that they feel better about. And Don was saying, you know, it's great to have a varied media diet. I totally agree. But right now, the easy media that you can get, it's like, it's all McDonald's. It's all fast food. It's full of high fructose corn syrup and lies. And that's what people who've got like 10 minutes are doing. I, I do community organizing in Frogtown and Rondo in St. Paul. And, you know, so I'm knocking on doors and I'm like, you know, the people who are doing here live, are working a job and a half if they can. They've got so little time. You know, they're getting information from their friends and family who are getting information from who knows what. And that's why it's so important to have real quality throughout and to kind of break this Fox News kind of crap. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, so Twin Cities Indie Media was, um, uh, there was a connection through the Ralph Nader campaign because the indie media servers were being run out of Seattle through people who were involved in the Nader campaign. Um, and so it was that, plus a lot of the people who were involved in Free Radio Twin Cities, um, which was the local pirate radio station that had been started in connection with the Highway 55 blockade. Um, and there was a young uh, uh, ham radio kid who'd gotten involved with that. Um, and he was like, I can build a seven watt station and I can get it up in a tree and we can start broadcasting that. So that group met with um, the, a couple of folks from the Nader campaign and then the, um, um, there was the Society of Animal Genetics, ISAC protests happened and they had seen what happened in Seattle and the police had seen what happened in Seattle. So they created a protest pen and they pushed everybody into Loring Park and they tear gassed left and right and, and that was another um, it was, you know, the same kind of thing that we saw again and again. And then 9-11 came and then the police state went crazy and everything happened like that. Um, but it was really one commu computer server. It was about seven to ten of us. Um, we were able to run a website using mostly pirated um, software. Um, we were able to run a newspaper. Um, we did seven, eight issues of the, of the free press of the Twin Cities. was the Twin Cities Indie Media Press. We went to... Virginia to do it because we wanted a union press, but we didn't want to use the Star Tribune or the Pioneer Press's press. Um, and, um, it, and, and what we found was production was actually easy. Um, it was distribution and getting those mm -hmm. copies out, which is why I've still got like 2,000 copies in my basement. Um, but that was one of the things. So the other thing though was Free Radio Twin Cities, which started out as a seven watt ham kit, but then got an activist from Berkeley which is where um, a lot of uh, free, free Radio Berkeley, uh, there was a, the guy that did that was doing it as a First Amendment, you, you shouldn't have a right to shut me down. And he kind of started a movement of pirate stations in the US between 98 and about 2002. Um, and uh, Free Radio Twin Cities, here's the cost. Um, it would be about 100 bucks for the antenna and it would be about 200 bucks for the cable, the really good coaxial cable that went from the antenna to your amplifier and your production equipment. The actual, um, to call it 100 watt uh, production equipment would be a one watt um, FM transmitter and a 100 watt uh, amplifier. That would be about 700 bucks. Um, then you had a mixing board. You could get a four channel, six channel mixing board for about 100 bucks, mics, and a couple of turntables, um, all told about $1,500. Um, now, of course, it was illegal, or rather, it was a violation of FCC rules. Um, and uh, so that's, but, the th but kind of the point is, A, it was able to be done. Um, it covered a couple of the May Day protests, um, and it was able to be done for a relatively smaller amount. KFAI is, actually runs about $600,000 to $800,000 a year budget. Um, but the first, the first stuff there, it's, it's cheaper. 
Um, to get a major license for like KQ, if that went on the air right now, that would probably be a seven to ten million dollar property mm -hmm. with all the stuff to run it. And because of consolidation, you need to get it to get into the radio market. If you remember, remember Rev 105, that was three stations run by Cargill Money, and that sold for about 50 million. Um, and so that's just 50 million, 800,000, uh -huh, 1,500 bucks. So that's kind of building uh, throughout the radio spectrum real quick. Um, I just want to throw in a real quick thing, really fast. Um, we, we should just remember that uh, basically through the work of like Prometheus Radio, they got these low power FM licenses like created and they're like available and we could talk about this later, but it'd be, I, it'd be really good if we get a discussion in the city is going about getting some of these licenses, getting that rolling, getting a bunch of voices on the air. I just want to throw that out there. Now we want to call up uh, Sue Ann Martinson. She's going to take over some of what the Lydia would have done. I know uh, Lydia would want to do practical tips concerning press releases. Uh, she likes things all laid out in advance. Me, I'm more enormous changes at the last minute. I don't care. I can, I can roll with the punches. But here's uh, Sue Ann Martinson, who's uh, on, from the WAN Media Committee, of course. Thank you, Don. Uh, I think you have a list which is called Alternative News Sources. Suggestions um, are welcome to add to this list. A lot of them are, well, almost all of them have websites. Some of them are also print media as well. And you may be familiar with a lot of them. And with some of them, you may not be so familiar. They're all very good sources of progressive or radical uh, news. And, pardon me? So Susan is telling me you can't hear me. No, it's too oh, loud. loud. Is it too loud? No. no. Some people are harder of hearing. Okay, so I'm not going to go over this full list, clearly. Um, I left two important, well, I probably left, left more than two important off. But one I left off is tcindimedia.org, because that still exists, which John was just talking about. And the other one I left off was Nygaard Notes. Jeff Nygaard is here. He has a blog that he sends out every, what is it, every month or so? A couple, couple times a month. That is excellent. And um, you can just Google Nygaard Notes, N-Y-G-A-A-R-D. Um, also, I just want to mention that, uh, of course, I, Don mentioned that I do a blog. It's called Wham Today. I have some cards back on the table back there. And... Um, also, I have a clipboard that I'm going to pass around. And at the top of it, there's, there are two clipboards. And the one clipboard was a wham sign up. But this one, which I'm holding in front of Don's face, sorry, is um, for a sign up for wham today. And if you put your email on here, you will get a weekly summary of the posts. You can also Google wham today and, and um, get onto it that way. Um, the actual address is www www.whamtoday.wordpress.com. Um, in regard, there's one other thing I just want to mention, and that is this Declaration of Internet Freedom. Our Internet Freedom, John mentioned that Seattle was the first major demonstration that was organized um, by email. Email organizing, of, close, of course, continues. Um, but they're trying to shut it down. They're trying to take it away from us. And there have been a number of bills that have been in Congress. Um, people have united to and organized to get those bills defeated. Um, but they keep bringing them back. So the freepress.net, which is on your um, which is on your list, freepress.net as a declaration of internet freedom. And on the back, it says, why a declaration on one side? And on the back, there is at the bottom a website where you can go and sign a petition. They're trying to collect as many names as possible. I think they almost got 50,000, but they need YouTube. We all need to sign it. Um, we should have millions on there. OK, and the other thing, um, that Lydia had wanted to talk about a little bit was organ when organizations, when you're planning something, how to do a press release, 
that you and that you, for example, if you want to be on Lydia's show or on Don's show, mm -hmm. you call them up enough in advance so they can plan so it's not last minute. Um, and as far as the press releases are concerned, there is a format for press releases. Now, they don't all have to be exactly alike, but um, a lot of the press releases that Lydia evidently gets, because I don't get these, are not done correctly. What you, what you want to do, um, and I'm sure you can find a form online, but what you want to do is, you know, first you put for immediate release or when you want it released. Um, you put your contact person at the top, and if you don't want that number published, then you put that you don't want it published, but that's your contact person. And then you put a, a little summary, kind of a who, what, where, and when, in, in, you know, maybe just a couple sentences at the top so they know what it's about. And then you go into your detail about what, the, what it is. And usually a press release is only about a page long. If it's, um, it can be maybe two pages if, if you really have you know, a lot of substantive things that you want to get cut. But um, I think it's important to kind of follow the, may, the tradition of how you do a press release. The other thing is that when you send them out, um, at least the way I've learned to do it is faxing, and you send it once maybe a couple weeks ahead of time, and then you send it again. You send it right closer to the date, because we're talking about here a lot to the major media, too. Because the major media has so much stuff that they get. Um, you can also send in individual emails. For example, if you were sending to this um, Pioneer Press or the Star Tribune, um, they have online, you can find individual emails for different reporters, or for news directors, or for whatever. You just have to do a little research. You have to go in there and look at the, to their website pages. Um, and then if you, now this has changed a little bit. It used to be that if you sent out to the neighborhood newspapers and other kinds of media like that, um, you could, you would get a month ahead of time, if you got it there a month ahead of time before the event, usually you could get a listing in their calendars. But that has changed somewhat. Some of them now you have to actually go online and put the information in yourself. So that's a little change with the internet. So this is just practical things that can be done. And um, I wish Lydia were here, but and you know, because she would have a lot more to say about it. But that's just what I wanted to say. So. Um, if Dan has a little comment. Yeah, um, yeah I've, I've been involved with the, a lot of, you know, stuff where you're trying to get a media package of some sort, you know, sort of put together and out to the press. Um, and my, my friend Nigel Perry is just, just the best at sort of um, putting a good release together. And uh, well, so for, you want, what you want to do is like, definitely try to give reporters the materials that, and, and including quotes or photos or whatever that they can use because Part of what happens and part of what adds up to effectively gatekeeping is that, you know, the Star Tribune in, you know, 1989 probably had 15 staffers at the state capitol. And now they have like three reporters, Lori Sturdevant, and maybe an intern. And so they just don't have any time. And, and that's actually really important. And you have to uh, adjust your approach to, to that, like, constraint. And so if you can give them, um, you know, information that's on a good footing, that's cited, that can, you know, easily be vetted or checked out, it's, it's a lot uh, less work for them. They're a lot more likely to be able to get your material uh, past their editor into the story selection process. And I think that's actually anything you can do to kind of ease that path to sort of say, to lay out, like, listen, like, this is the narrative so that they don't have to put it every piece together themselves that that will deliver results if you do it persistently and also and i think working through the capital press corps because that is one place where reporters are concentrated a lot of the time is actually a really good place to go so if you hit them with press releases and you know cited material and like say okay here's a youtube video here are image stills that you can use etc um so if you get all those elements together you're a lot more likely to be able to get bounced with the kind of work you're trying to do so that's my sort of nutshell well in but you're talking about writing a story, where I'm talking about maybe covering an event. Yeah. And so we're talking about two kind of different things. And 
No, but you're absolutely right. And to put together a uh, good press packet is what you're yeah. talking about, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, I think uh, Polly Mann has a little something to say here, and then we'll get to the questions and comments, and uh, people okay. will just uh, another minute. Well, I want to thank you. I not only didn't know what you had to talk about tonight, I didn't know I didn't know. <laughs> and it's been so informative and I'm, I'm really grateful. And we all are grateful to the to the panel here because they came, of course, out of the goodness of their heart. So the, the basket, <laughs> yeah. the basket for the is for the expenses. If you could just put a dollar or something in here to cover the costs that we have with printing costs and that sort of thing. So. That's it, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Paul. Indeed, so now we would uh, like to open it up uh, uh, for questions and comments. Uh, other people here that uh, ha have something that they would like to add to this, uh, because we have a lot of it. And uh, Kathleen? Um. I was listening to Tara Gross one night, and I've heard um, Larry K. Johnston speak to Amy Goodman as well, but he was talking to uh, Terry Gross one night saying that in Europe especially, they have much better internet access and um, electronic access to anything, and it's a lot cheaper than is charged here. And I think that's a disgrace, but <laughs> this country is a disgrace. Yeah, I would just uh, quickly say, um, well, as with uh, mass transit, I would say that uh, the expenses of setting up internet are uh, uh, di uh, distance and density dependent. Um, and so that means it's, it's really difficult to wire up huge stretches of America. But that's why we need to have better, more effective use of wireless uh, spectrum and making public access like internet spectrum available as, as well as like laying down fiber optic on University Avenue when the whole thing is already ripped up anyway. But. Which, by the way, we are not doing. Um, uh, the um, although it's 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 easier to um, to fiber optically wire a smaller country where it's denser. Um, it is also very much the case that the European social democracies are used to the model of uh, much more. It's it's much easier to get the concept of public infrastructure through the minds of a German or a Austrian or those kind of voters. And so basically, yeah, we're behind because Wall Street has made us behind, and they like it that way. And uh, the amount of profit that uh, people are making, um, it used to be that you would make a bazillion dollars on a newspaper. Newspapers used to be have these huge profit margins, in part because the public notices, in part because of classifieds. Um, and instead, of course, of pumping that money into the newspapers, they pumped it into acquiring bigger empires. Um, but I, you know, so I was. I uh, um, have. There's a position policy, a position statement for the Austrian Labor Party that I was looking at that says we need a nationwide public-private entity to get fiber optic to every place in Europe, in, in in Austria, and so there it's a matter of public policy. Now, what, earlier when I was saying that you know the one percent, their reign will not last. That Goliath can no longer see its its feet. So when that system comes crashing down, what happens historically is we get this little tiny period um, where we can push stuff. The New Deal, there was about three years where FDR was able to actually get stuff going. WPA, all that stuff is about 34 to 37. Um, so we have to be ready at that point with our ideas uh, to get that stuff in play too. So that's why one of the reasons, even though it's politically untenable right now, we're, we're looking at it. So, and before I forget it, if you would like, a, I mentioned about uh, Syria, and there's a great article about Syria in here by Phyllis Bennett. So this is a September issue of uh, of uh, Z Magazine, and uh, Margaret thinks it's uh, not so very good, I think. And uh, so anyway, you can, it's a free copy, and you can get it up here if you if you wish. And Sue Ann now has. Okay, I want to say again that there are two clipboards going around. This clipboard is for WAM today, and, and you don't have to sign it, but if you would like to be on the email list for the weekly summary. Now, on that sheet of yellow paper where I passed out all that um, 
those different websites. Um, I go to those websites for you in case you want me to. And I find a lot of good articles on there that I post. And so um, I'm hoping that some of you would like to get the weekly summary. There's a lot of good information on current progressive radical issues that are um, posted on WHAM today. And um, you can also subscribe to it. Um, for example, Margaret, who's sitting here in the front row, has written a couple articles on Iran and, um, and, and the other kind of Iraq and other interesting kinds of uh, things that have been picked up and read and, uh, nationally. And so um, Colleen writes a lot and I post her things. So I'm just saying um, it would really be you know, interesting and if you don't want to have to go to all those websites, I can go there for you and find good articles. We got a question back here. There's, there's, a, a there's a number of different, um, so first off, getting rid of the Fairness Doctrine was a big deal, and it got the concept that you could lie, and that was all right, it was a big deal. Secondly, there was um, a Supreme Court ruling with regards to Nike, where Nike had made an advertising claim that was shown to be a lie. Somebody sued them and said, it, they've done a lie, and this kind of whole corporate, is, corporate personhood Supreme Court which has been, of course, anyway. So that was a ruling that was done in place. Deregulation has meant that we don't have challenges to licenses, like it used to be that a light, that a that any kind of broadcast media would be licensed every year or three years, and then it's now been pushed out to seven or eight years. And the because uh, when Counter Propaganda Coalition, we did two challenges to licenses. And we basically got thrown out because we were only a citizens group concerned about the media we didn't have standing. Um, so there is also, however, um, in Japan, so when Japan deals with its media, a public outcry really is something that gets people's attention. But because the gatekeepers of the corporate media don't allow the public to sw that that voice to swell because they don't want to have public voices swelling they're about a control mechanism they're not about that stuff happening the stuff gets shut down and the reason that in my mind the reason that occupy was able to launch and i mean there were 300 occupy encampments across the us because people saw what happened in it was the it was the arab spring which people said, oh my God, we can take over public space, and then boom, it got shut, and then people didn't know what to do with it, so there was like, okay, that was it, and you know, Seattle, we were able to block Seattle, and then Miami comes, and they bring in the police state, and they shut it all down, um, and so the public outcry system is broken in the U.S. because they don't want that kind of public outcry, whereas the Tea Party in 2010, where they did want a reactionary apparently grassroots movement now the size of the of the of, there is a little bit of movement in the tea party and there was a pretty decent sized movement in occupy but one of them is promoted by fox and pushed and it becomes part of the mainstream thing whereas the other one is like okay we're gonna be shoving you off into that little left corner and maybe we can get you named a terrorist too um so i mean that there's there's a bunch of things going on yeah but yeah i mean it's like these are bald-faced lies how the hell how the heck are they doing it
I just wanted to mention, uh, there's, there's a, a line in The Big Lebowski that I kind of live by, which is when Walter bangs the table at the diner and says that the Supreme Court has roundly rejected prior restraint. And, and that's important, is that what it means in the United States is that um, you basically, it's really almost impossible to prevent somebody from publishing almost anything, whether it's diplomatic cables or political misinformation like this radio segment or ridiculous ads. And it, it, it would be a huge problem if the government could step in and prevent those printing presses from rolling or that transmission from rolling. You can only take it, uh, action after it happens. I just, I just wanted to mention that in, in both these cases, we're dealing with the ridiculous stuff that's out there. So it, it's really unfortunate that so much ridiculous misinformation gets out there. I, and I think like, you know, if KFII was the venue, I feel like the program, you, you should be able to go to the program director and say this is like, you know, way out of balance. Like this already went out and it was silly. Um, but, but I think that's important in terms of when we look at uh, the way viewpoints are expressed. I, I'm actually a big fan of the lack of prior restraint in the United States. I just want to mention that quick. And I would, I would just say as, it, it, we, we didn't say it, but we're both, Sue and I are both on KFI's board. Um, I think that's actually problematic. Um, and that going to the program director and saying, okay, what's going on? Now, back in the old days, we would know what would happen is we have to give an hour of time somewhere to somebody who's going to be doing the opposite side. And I would suspect that that, within the context of KFAI, might be a solution to that, although, um, if they didn't do a call to action that gets us in trouble with being a uh, not-for-profit institution, if so A, they, maybe they shouldn't have done it because it might have been over the edge. If they didn't, then they're as protected as Rush Limbaugh is to make up whatever stories he wants. But we should probably, because it's the spirit of KFAI, look for some kind of balance on that. What? I mean, I think that uh, there there's certainly been quite a number of shows on KFI which have been of the opposite viewpoint that have been people that are pushing that, and it's uh, you know, different people have different opinions. It's it's it's, it's uh, sometimes with these uh, people coming from these war torn countries. I mean, some of them are associated with these former warlords or who knows what goes on in this language. We never knew all that, but. Uh, so be it, we gave them a chance to uh, 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 communicate. So uh, I would suggest that if people who didn't like it, they should do, they could, they could make a, uh, send a, uh, an, uh, a message to the, that show that you thought that this was uh, not being truthful. I think it's best to go through the show, not through the program director, because they'll modify it. I mean, for a long time, I, uh, uh, first 10 years I had to say nothing in this program, Northern Sun News, is, should reflect the opinions or viewpoints of the KFAI board of directors, staff, you know, and XYZ. But, so that's been dropped now. But, so we do have uh, some diversity of opinion. I mean, we have uh, Green Party and Democrats that are pushing their candidacy. We have uh, some people who push the military. Al McFarland, he, he says people should join the military. He's been in the military. Well, that's fine. He, he goes into these things that, uh, so I think it's better to have some, you know, we don't have a, a party line. We don't have this or that. But if they are lying, I think it's best to uh, go to, uh, to the particular show, and maybe they'd want to learn something from that. Or, I mean, I don't know if it was the host or somebody they had on as a guest. Maybe they want to have somebody else, but maybe it's getting too late. But it's my suggestion. Say, uh, is Mark next, or and then you two? And... No, no, Mark behind you here. Hi, thanks for showing up. Um, I want to thank KFAI. Um, we did a little bit on the Andy Driscoll show about our. Paul Wellstone event that happened on October 23rd, and Colleen was gracious to attend, and we think the event went real well. We got a little mention on KSTP television morning news. And um, after that, uh, as far as I know, nobody else showed up. We, we couldn't get MinPost to show up, we couldn't get the uptake to show up, and that was really embarrassing. And it was because they would have learned something that they might have had to actually report. And that was the truth about what happened 10 years ago and we were doing the work that they needed to do 10 years ago. Um, when I speak, I like to use history as a context. And Bob Woodward said there would never be another Watergate. 
God damn, he was right. Okay, what's happening now is 10 times worse than Watergate ever was. The other thing, um, William Randolph first told William Remington, you give me the pictures, I'll give you the war. What has changed? Nothing has changed. You know, so when we talk about seeking, you know, information or talking to blogs, um, you know, I, I have a saying that the problem with the truth is it's a supply and demand thing. And the supply always exceeds the demand. And how, we, how do we go about that? Now, as far as the media goes, I'm a national security whistleblower on issues of illegal government, domestic surveillance, and something of which journalists have very much to fear, as, as do we all, and financial crimes at the regulatory level. I'm going to do some name dropping of some names of journalists that you might recognize that I had had lengthy conversations with that either represented, um, you know, good interest and very much interest. Bob Anderson, senior executive producer for 60 Minutes. Gretchen Morgensen from the New York Times. Jonathan Wheel from Bloomberg. Uh, Marcy Gordon from AP. Dana Priest from Washington Post. We were in lengthy communications and it was like they got a phone call. And I completely dropped off the radar. I, at least one of them called me back and said, listen, I apologize, my editor's pulling the story, there's nothing I can do. Uh, Bob Anderson from 60 Minutes, we were this close, and then he said, your story's too complex for 60 Minutes. We would never be able to get there. And I said, God, Bob, you're, you're 60 Minutes, for God's sake. You know, so that's the state of media. They get a phone call from above, or their editors pull the story. I won't even go into the Star Tribune. I've given them stuff that they could have won a Pulitzer for. And the, if you guys only knew how much is happening out there that nobody has the guts to write. And then we need to talk about, I revere journalists like Danny Casalero and Gary Webb, okay? Now we gotta look at what happened to Amber Lyon from CNN or Andrew Ware from CNN. That sends a message. I wanna talk about what happened to Tim Russert. I wanna talk about what happened to Mark Haynes, okay? I wanna talk about what happened to Andrew Breitbart. We might not agree with his politics, but hey, all these people have a heart attack. And it's like when Paul Wellstone, died. Why, why do politicians die right when they're in the middle of an investigation or something big? It's, it's embarrassing. Uh, thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, and, uh, I, I actually wanted to mention Amber Lyon earlier. This is something which y'all may not have heard, uh, but Amber Lyon uh, was a reporter at, at CNN, and she went and investigated all this enormous amounts of you know state violence against protesters in Bahrain, which was, again, part of this Arab Spring, only it was part of the Arab Spring that was a problem for a U.S. ally, so it had a total green light of suppression and cover-up and all that. And so when she was trying to come back with these stories and footage and everything, um, you know, they got attacked by the state police there, and CNN's editorial process forced lies to be crammed in there, and then it turned out that CNN International actually is paid to produce essentially infomercials for Bahrain, so there's like a commercial conflict of interest, and, and she's actually starting a new website, I think, called muckraker.com, and that's going to come out in a couple months or so, and so th that's another great example of this kind of, you know, gatekeeping and commercial stuff that goes on, um, and then as to whether or not the people like assassinate politicians. I mean, Anwar al-Awlaki's son um, was on his way back to the United States and they sent a drone just to get his son and like take him out even though he's a US citizen. And uh, so that, that's another topic which hasn't been able to enter the presidential debates and everything, you know? The fact that we've lost like all these Magna Carta era freedoms essentially. Um, but um, some guys uh, from uh, We Are Change, Luke Radowski went and like sort of stormed the spin room after one of these debates and kept asking all these politicians uh, like Debbie Wasserman Schultz and most memorably Robert Gibbs, a senior White House advisor about Anwar al-Awlaki and also talked to like Lawrence O'Donnell from MSNBC about his you know, lack of covering the National Defense Authorization Act that lets, you know, U.S. citizens be detained, and so... The kill list. Yeah, well, right, the kill list and all that. And so, um, the We Are Change guys were, with the, the Gibbs interview that they got out there, like, that went viral. Like, they really did a good job boiling down that issue and showing the kind of craven, violent, political hack nature of the establishment in a nice little video nutshell, and that really got picked up. And then after their Lawrence O'Donnell interview, a couple days later, Lawrence went on his show and said, 
the, the media is, is selling you a drug and it's the two-party system. And he just kind of said that on MSNBC, you know? And so um, it, it shows that with, with the We Are Change guys, who also showed up at the Wellstone event, which I was tweeting. I yes. couldn't make it, but I tweeted, yeah, right? <laughs> and so, so th that's the example of where and you do a kind of in, inter interrogatory, real, like rough journalism with the resources you have. You throw those video clips out there you can get that bounce, and then, like the reaction with O'Donnell shows, you can actually shift what's actually been going out in the main outlets. So it's a circuitous process, but a good example of where you can get traction. You had um, another issue that I haven't heard much about on independent media that I was hoping maybe would be aired has to do with the. Uh, voting machine uh, company ownership in some key states by Romney. And um, there actually was an article in her, uh, in uh, Fortune magazine, which I thought was really surprising. And I've seen some kind of, you know, blog type stuff. But this could be another way to steal the election, just like <laughs> before. Mm -hmm. And before. I don't know that people are really you know, aware of this possibility, um, because it's, it's you know, a lot of the swing states are involved that also have Republican governors and secretaries of state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have the equipment to do this, and is anybody tracking this? And I also heard that the um, exit polls, that um, the news agencies have said they don't have enough money to uh, run exit polls this year in 19 states, and I bet the swing states would be among them, which would make it even harder for us to find out if there was hanky-panky. Well, uh, Harvey Wasserman, who did a lot with, in Ohio uh, on 2004 election, and the Green Party especially, uh, they couldn't get any money out of the uh, Democratic uh, candidate for president, uh, uh, what, what, what was his name? The Bazillionaire. He didn't have any to, to follow up on that about how, yes, that, that there is the story about how uh, the uh, servers were in a Republican headquarters in another state for the state, for this Ohio, and uh, all sorts of uh, people who would deal with these things have said how it can be done. Well, they've just written another book about it, how, how the election of 2012 will be stolen. And even this uh, sort of right-wing magazine, or left, it tries to be left and right, uh, American Free Press, they just had a cover article about that. So there's, you know, it's always on the bottom, but it's, it's uh, you know, sometimes I wonder if uh, the Democrats care if the uh, elections are stolen. I mean, you know, the 2000 election, we all know about that one. And, uh, uh, you know, Al Gore looked to the wise old men in uh, Washington. They didn't want it to no illegitimacy for the system, don't you know? And then he, he said about a year later he didn't want to run a guerrilla campaign. Well, they shut down uh, uh, Jesse Jackson from having some street heat in, in, uh, in uh, Florida, whereas the Republican Senate staffers were shown in this wonderful uh, film called Unprecedented. If you remember back, remember pounding on the doors of the Dade County uh, the board, uh, board of Commissioners as they were counting the votes. Well, they did this, uh, they circled the ones in the pictures, they, they froze it out, and lo and behold, there were Senate staffers, these shock troops are flown down to uh, Miami there to, uh, to accomplish this. So it's, uh, Sometimes you wonder if the Democrats just say, oh, well, you know, if you want it, or, or we're so similar, <laughs> you know. And, 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 you know or, or on the other hand, I will say my own uh, prejudices is that uh, the Republicans thought, well, if they let us get away with that, maybe they'll let us get away with 9-11. Um, I, I believe I, it. 
<laughs> within the realm of possibility for sure. Um, but uh, I, I think actually, I think this guy Roger Stone was actually involved in what they called the Brooks Brothers riot in Florida. And he's actually a Gary Johnson supporter now, and he writes a ton of really critical stuff about the Republicans. Since that's one little detail, but um, yeah, I know it as a computer developer, I have to deal a lot with like bugs and systems and security and you know viruses and spam and stuff. And it's just so, it's very shady and absurd how the voting machines can so easily be hacked. Like if you, you can actually load a, a negative value in a memory cartridge and then like, so you can say negative 30,000 for Gore and plus 30,000 for Bush. And then the numbers will just, the total will still be accurate because you started with the negative memory card. And so that type of flaw, like they ought to not allow negative cards is, is masked inside closed source software and that's another reason why demanding open source of all aspects of the programs that run the government and not treating those like black boxes, whether they're voting machines or breathalyzers, is actually really important. And um, I think the Minnesota recounts have shown that our paper-based process is totally a much more sound basis than these electronic systems. And uh, one thing I wanted to say that um, what we've been talking about, there is a left, there's a couple of, of structures. There's kind of a the MSNBC left, which is kind of the marketed, you know, um, daily show kind of, we, we need to show that there's a difference and there's a big market out there because not everybody is. So there's that left and then there's, you know, a, a kind of a progressive radical activist left media sphere. Now the um, churches got radio stations. If you're driving out in, in far off places, you listen to what's going on and it's country music and it's church stuff and it's far right church stuff because they realized that they needed to build that network and it was in their benefit to build that network. So we have been doing network building here and there and I, we're not as good at it necessarily. We don't necessarily have the stick to um, but that's sometimes how stories surface is because they bounce around in our network and they, and they get to the point where they pop up and then, and then though, then they run into power. And I'm a, kind of a, that, who's that awful guy, um, Saul Alinsky, um, gets pitched at now again. Um, his power analysis is I think really great, which is it's not in the benefit of the corporate wing of the Democratic Party, which is arguably between 40 and 70% of the Democratic Party to really challenge the system. Right. and. And so it's like you get up to that level and if it's too big a challenge, then you're gonna have a lot of suppressive fire, as it were, to keep it from busting up. Anyway, Zabi Hero, Zero. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like the conversation here and, and I love the, like, like the, the open forum here, but um, like one thing I always see and try to promote in, in in, in media and stuff is that, you know, there's a lot of people here and we're all kind of preaching to the choir a bit, where like we're, we're all on the same page in this room, pretty much. And, but um, like, what can we do to, you know, spread the, spread the gospel of, of, you know, like truth in media and, and, and stuff? Well, uh, one of the things um, is like, we're pretty Caucasian in this room too. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, that there's a little flyer on many of your seats. There's a gathering for media justice that's put together by KFI as one of the co-sponsors, Community Action Against Racism in the Main Street Project, which are mostly organized, led by people of color or Community Action Against Racism is mostly Hmong folk. So reaching out with this kind of progressive media mentality and talking with them and finding a good place for them and us to come to mind. Um, and so Saturday, December 8th from 10 to 3, we don't know the location yet. Um, I think that, um, that, that having the choir singing together and singing loud, because I, I gotta say, I'm, I'm a fan of you start from your base, then you get to the people who would agree with you, and then you get them organized, and then you get to the people who are leaning towards you and you get them organized. Because I've been in situations where we're like, how do we get Joe middle of the road? And I'm like, N you, you got to build strength from this side up. So I think that the fact that we've got 50 people in this room now and we're going to go out there with a better understanding of where we're at and perhaps a, new, a renewed emphasis that we must get control of our media because we must get our words out. It's like, 
the collective unconsciousness is our media, and right now the collective unconsciousness is controlled by these zombie dead undead corporations. Yeah, you got the zombie shirt going. <laughs> so uh, that's just a quick response. What? So Polly Band was. Yeah, I just want to build on that and just say I was sitting here and thinking how little I do know, and how wonderful it is to hear you and just to find out if there are other ways if, that Wham could help in getting in getting information out. Because I don't think I'm the only one member of the choir that doesn't know how to sing. I mean, I think we've got a whole organization that, that is in that same spot. That we're, we're very ignorant about the workings of the media. And Sue Ann has done her best. And this is the beginning, I hope. But I wish that if you knew ways that we could be more help, and I'm going to be thinking of ways that you can be more help to us. Um, uh, one thing I would say as a possible uh, counterpoint uh, or a difference to that approach is that um, another way you can work media is you don't always necessarily need uh, a huge uh, base to you know be a, at least 51 percent of the society sometimes it just takes enough of an ad hoc kind of group or coalition to knock out the worst policy that's coming down the pike. And so we've actually had pretty good luck uh, intervening at the state capitol per to prevent them from enhancing all these intelligence gathering laws and stuff. And it wasn't because we had more real lobbyist firepower than all of law enforcement and the government, because they get paid to go down to talk to the other government people in this like circular relationship. But instead we just like had to, you know, just barely enough people to just sort of throw enough red flags into that whole situation to get the politicians to back off. Because politicians will go down the path of least resistance and you don't necessarily need to have a huge base to put up more enough resistance to deflect what they're doing. And so um, part of what I've sort of been getting at with the open source intelligence network thing too is like uh, you can model everything that happens in like government and politics and stuff through something that are called decision cycles. And this is really important. Um, it it kind of actually goes back all the way to like the Sun Tzu and the Art of War. But um, everything is represented as a process of repeated decision cycles. Um, it, it, or there's an acronym, UDA, Observe, Orient, Decide, Action. Observe, Orient, Decide, Action. And so the whole system is like a huge thing of these UDA loops executing all the time. And so if you can inject information into strategic points in those loops to stop those decision cycles from occurring, or you are able to execute the cycles faster than the adversarial system is, which is how the military applies this theory, um, you can basically disrupt the entire like decision-making structure, and you don't actually need to have an enormous base movement to do that. You just have to have enough information to kind of get the hooks in. And that's where the real-time Twitter and that kind of thing comes in, because you're jumbling up all the normal political decisions in an, in an arena like the Capitol or something by doing it quickly, by jumping ahead in time, you disrupt all the decision cycles. So that's a way that you can get around the need of having to necessarily have a huge base organized politically. Could you repeat those four again? Uh, it's, it's observe, orient, decide, action. Uh, or uh, decide, execute, or whatever. So observe, orient, decide, action. So if you look up uh, Robert Steele, uh, S-T-E-E-L-E, -E -E, Robert Steele, look, open source intelligence, UDA loops, like, uh, he's got a good website, it's called like, it's phibetaiota.net or some, <laughs> some Greek configuration. But yeah, look up Robert Steele's website. There's a lot of really good theoretical stuff that I think we could use, because like with the war machine and wham and everything, it's like we gotta be able to jump in these decision cycles before they can execute up into bigger wars. Sue Ann uh, would like to uh, uh, make a few announcements of some wham events coming up. And I think we could continue on a little bit unless, uh, unless we have to be out of here, but it's uh, been quite interesting. We don't need to be out of here. It's a wonderful audience. I think some people are probably letter ready to leave. We were trying to keep it to two hours, but if some of you want to stay for a few more minutes, that's okay too. Um, but we'll give those who need to leave an opportunity to. Um, on Thursday, November 8th, post-election discussion in potluck that will be here in this room, um, 4200 Cedar. Wham is sponsoring that. And right after that will be Brian Terrell presenting No to Drones. Uh, Wham now has a Ground All Drones Committee. And so at 7 p.m. we're bringing Brian in. He was a, is a Catholic worker who was convicted in a U.S. District Court 
for trespassing at Whitman Air Force Base um, where the Predator drones are remotely operated. So um, it's a drone issue and uh, we heard Dan talk a little bit about that and there's a lot of that going on. Um, and then on November 10th, there will be a community sing. This will be at the Eagles Club, which is over in the Seward area at 25th Avenue and 25th Street. And I don't know if you've been involved with any of the Min uh, Minnesota Sings groups, MN Sings they call themselves. They do community singing, they are wonderful, and it is just a fun evening. It's also a benefit for Wham, so you can come support Wham, but it's just a great deal of fun. And then um, they really know how to lead us in, in singing and getting everybody in, joining in. Um, no solos in this one. Um, we also have a song contest that goes with that. And so these flyers are over on the table if you're interested in writing some words to You Are My Sunshine. And it says the deadline's the 29th of October, which was yesterday, but we've extended it to November 4th. So you can still turn something in. And then just quickly, the effect of U.S. sanctions on Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. And that will be Thursday, November 29th at McAllister, um, Plymouth United Church. That's in St. Paul, right by McAllister. So, um, great events. There are flyers for all of them on the table over there. And I just want to say, too, you've been such a great audience. I'm watching your faces. <laughs> and you're wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for all for coming. Who had their hand up? You did hear me. Are you still watching? I did. Oh, did uh, yeah, I had my hand up. Yeah, now is your chance. Oh, now's my chance. Well, I was going to kind of, you know, speak to what Toby had uh, mentioned earlier about, you know, we're preaching to the choir, and how do we get beyond the choir? And I think what it has to do with media, which I have some experience with, because I uh, worked with a vitamin D uh, advocacy group called Grassroots Health that uh, disseminated information about vitamin D, and vitamin D deficiency is the reason that your vitamin bottle now probably says, you know, vitamin D uh, promotes breast health and, and so on. Um, and I think that one way to, to get beyond that and to work media into the conversation is to, you know, to focus on other topics besides media. Um, and, and that's what we did. Uh, and, and we were very effective at giving people vitamins and vitamin D tests. And, building an entire network of civilian media that then spread through their communities and told, educated each other about a certain topic. And I think often we forget that that, that is media. It doesn't have to, media doesn't always have, broadcasting starts with your mouth. And that, you know, that's like the fundamental uh, little piece that, that we need to have. So uh, I would encourage people to, to have other things uh, that, that will, bring people in that are areas of interest and and then to have, you know, well, okay, this is a problem. Uh, how are we going to disseminate the information? Because just like the political topics we've been talking about here, the media is lying to you about your vitamins. And I mean that in a very direct way. They're lying about you, about to you about how much vitamin D that you need. Uh, and there are reasons why they're doing that. So they're not only lying about political ads and everything else, but you know, right down to products that, that you need uh, necessary nutrients for life um, mm -hmm. and to organize around those instead, you know, those topics. Well, I think that's a great example of how the, the media is the message, you know, classic phrase, but yeah. I think that, that gets right to it. And, and so I think when we've had success getting things to go viral, as we call it, it is something that can kind of be replicated. And whether that involves giving people something that works like a press kit that you can put in their hand or whatever, making it so that people can replicate that sort of media distribution process themselves and take it up mm -hmm. and do it themselves and have agency to do it themselves, mm -hmm. that, that is what works. And that might be a, one way to universalize the success that you're talking about. Yes. You know, there was a time when Paul Wellstone was still alive, but there was a, going to be a the FDA was going to, you know, restrict a lot of on uh, vitamins and, and uh, supplements, and there was kind of a left-right uh, outburst, which really caused them to. And Paul did agree to it, but of course, you know, uh, people say, "Well, you're it's a nutcase." 
uh, for talking about these ideas, which is how they're, they always try and you know like belittle you. Mm -hmm. But then there was a thing where they, they did go across the uh, across the political spectrum. But you know these a lot of you know some number of issues do cut different ways. And, and I just wanted to say to uh, Polly's question about what can all y'all do. First is support the WAM Media Committee, um, which I think is great. Um, the Counter Propaganda Coalition, when we were doing media fairs, it was we would get local media outlets and activist outlets to, to get them there so they could cross pollinate. The second thing, and this is all of the stuff that um, uh, Dan's been talking about with open source, is you, uh, if you want to have the success of things that go viral and you want the success of mass stuff, you have to give up the idea that you'll be able to fully control your message. You can't do that anymore. You have to admit that if you give it, like, and this, you know, the, the, the case of the Somali folks that are, you know, complaining about the marriage amendment, it's like if we want to have folks feel that they have that agency, then they're going to go do their stuff the way that they are going to be able, to, I mean, it's going to, it's going to let go. So you, you try and see, you can't just, seed your good stuff out there, make it in a way that people can pick it up and carry it and make it their own, realize that some people are gonna get whacked out about it, but just, I mean, the, to, to get to the people, you gotta trust the people. You know, one time when uh, what, uh, there was a war going on about 10, 15 years ago between Ethiopia and Eritrea on the Horn of Africa, the, 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 there were two shows right next to each other, we almost had the Horn of Africa war being fought in the KFI. <laughs> So it got a little tense there for a while, but uh, you know, there that's how it is, you know. But then we worked on doing it. Who wants to say something else? Have, did you, have you, you hey, the woman in the back with the shirt yeah, with the hat. Uh, if the lady with the vitamin D could talk to me, and if anybody could talk to me briefly about um, the marriage amendment, because I, I can't understand it after looking online for three hours. But the, the one little thing I just brought up personally is that. Um, we uh, a site called Weasel Zipper. Does anybody know about it? What? Weasel Zipper. It seems it seems in the right way, and I know I I think this is unusual because like Internet Man, I I've been on the internet and I've never Googled anything before where I go through like ten pages and never find anything about the organization other than what they put out. Mm -hmm. And that, that made me mm -hmm. concerned. I didn't understand that. Well, then just push the delete. Maybe. John, <laughs> John Coase had had something. You talked earlier about the infrastructure, about uh, fiber optics particularly. You know, there's a great opportunity that happens every single year. It's been happening over the past few. I watched a six-mile business district of Lake Street be reconstructed, where they completely and totally rebuilt it, which was probably not necessary, but they did it. And I, I've gone to Peter McLaughlin and Evan others and said, let's put fiber optics the entire length of Lake Street while this is being laid, plus let's put in uh, th geothermal so all the businesses, this would have been a huge attraction for business, yep. it would have been good for small business, and it would have been great for communication for all of these kind of things. We, we just are going through the process of rebuilding University Avenue, so a 10 mile uh, construction that's going from downtown to downtown, the Twin Cities, they could be doing it there, they're not doing any of that. Uh, and they just rebuilt Riverside Avenue, a major rebuild of the street. They don't do anything for the infrastructure that, that would be bringing it up to date and to bring us closer to Europe and at a fraction of the cost it would be to go back afterwards and put it back in. So just to make people aware of that, these people are supposed to represent us that are in city council and the, and the county commission and state legislature, but it seems that they don't represent and they're really not doing things for the public infrastructure, they're really doing only things for the special infrastructure. We'll get back over here, but Margaret here at some point. Oh, I just wanted to know the status. I know that um, there was a, the FCC was trying to pass some kind of law that the big, the bigger corporations could, their, their internet could be faster. So if we wanted to look at, a, like you guys, it would be slower, or look at WAM, it would be slower. What's, what's the status of that? Yeah, uh, net neutrality, um, that's, the, I think, the policy you're talking about. Right. The, the, and it's a little technical, but the idea is just basically like if you're on, a, let's say, a Verizon phone and you try to go to a website that has some kind of corporate partnership with Verizon, Verizon would rather get money out of a corporate partnership to give that traffic higher priority to respond faster than going to another website. And so net neutrality 
is the basis that all of these uh, data packets should move uh, equally, that, that that kind of deal making, that kind of tiered internet would not be available. Because if, that, if, that, if this kind of thing takes hold, um, then essentially you'll have a, a, a cheap internet that can only go to a few places and then expensive internet that will let you out to other stuff. And then that is, a, would be a really bad outcome. And then, uh, okay, uh, there's a website, uh, muninetworks.org, M-U-N-I networks.org. And then uh, a, a group in town, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, I believe has a group of people, a guy that we know named Chris Mitchell, who I think was involved in indie media back in the day. Um, they have been the kinds of people that are like, hey, like, let's put in fiber optic when we rip up these streets. Because fiber optic is actually cheap by the foot, it's just it's very expensive to install. So if you just do it under every street, you can do it. But the thing is, politicians just have a way of, with the notable exception of Al Franken complaining about the Comcast NBC deal, Politicians just avoid that stuff because there's no mileage in it for them to try to push those issues. That's usually how it works. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah we're gonna, is somebody who hasn't spoken, you two have, and wait a minute. Jan? Yeah, I don't think the night should pass without a mention of the yes men. Does everybody know about the yes men? Yes. I was listening to the radio one day, BBC, and I heard uh, the announcer say that uh, Dow Chemicals had announced that they were going to uh, remediate the uh, Bhopal site. They were going to give a, take care of all the people who were injured in that chemical accident. They were going to tell, they were going to actually tell what the chemical was, which they had over the many, many years it's been since the uh, accident happened. I, and I thought, wow, that can't be right. And lo and behold, it turned out to be the Yes Men, who are so very good at um, turning media in their direction uh, by pointing out these major scams. But uh, the first one that they did, I believe, was uh, concerned with uh, George Bush. I think they, uh, they had a, a website that was very close to his, and it was, but it was a parody website. And I, they do have some films out. Um, you can Google Yes Men. They're very, very clever and outrageous, and they keep getting away with stuff. Plus, they are now uh, teaching other people to do the same thing. And today, we saw a little um, YouTube or something like that about um, a visit of some young folks to the Cayman Islands to look for Romney's money. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know. Humor is always a good thing. Yep. Yeah. So what, do just one or two more questions, and. Uh, Michael hasn't said anything yet, and then, you, and then you'll get it. Michael? Okay. Well, um, for those of you who don't know, um, I'm Michael Kaplan. I'm the candidate for the U.S. Senate that the Star Tribune and NPR and all the rest of the corporate media refuse to even acknowledge exists. And I'm very much okay with that. Um, I'm actually, I'm looking forward to, in eight days from now, being a civilian again. And I look forward to the shock of the media going, Wait a minute, how did he get those sorts of numbers? And this is kind of where I'm going with this conversation. Um, I'd like to hear you guys speak on, on, um, on are getting past the corporate media? Because the corporate media are lying. And they're lying to all of us. And they've been lying to us for decades. And like I say, the media has become the enemy of the norm, informed public, which makes them the enemy of democracy itself. Probably why NPR doesn't like me, I suppose. But I don't hear you guys speak of breaking past the corporate media blockade. Mm -hmm. um, and also, by the way, also I'd love to hear you guys talk about liberal censorship. Because it's not just NPR that doesn't want to know I exist. There's lots of liberal groups trying to pretend that this campaign doesn't exist. But we do exist. So I'd love to hear you guys talk about, A, getting past the corporate media blockade. Dan, you're the man on that one. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and liberal censorship. Yeah. Well, I think to actually come back to the, the yes men point is actually a great way to look at that because um, the yes men are an example of a little kind of affinity group sort of cadre of what are doing something called culture jamming. That's sort of the handle for it. And with culture jamming, the idea is that you do something that's kind of flashy, it's kind of an intervention into the passive spectacle or the pseudo events which make up the narrative flow of the general power structure. And so if you can do that in a successful way, and uh, I've been involved in you know, doing, helping edit a few videos that did similar things, like I edited the video where Newt Gingrich got glitter bombed, and the next night, that was on The Daily Show, and Samantha Bee was throwing glitter on John Stewart. So that was like a home run for, you know, 
for culture jamming, right? Because there was something like funny about it because a lot of times the corporate media needs to fill airtime. And so what you want to do is get around their sort of desire to fill their airtime with that sort of pseudo event, like spectacular flow and finding something else because they need to uh, essentially kind of co-opt what you're doing in order to entertain their audience. That That is one way to get around the way that they're trying to work. In terms of um, actual media production flow, I think that doing things like videos where um, an individual video kind of stands on its own, but also sort of opens up conceptually to a wider world, like it plants the idea in the head of the viewer that something larger is going on that they can relate to and that they can push along, and that that can kind of be reproduced and they can participate by sending it out. That's sort of one of the ingredients of what can make a thing go viral. And so I think that getting those little sort of chunks that can be replicated digitally, essentially, that's sort of kind of the techniques I would say are sort of out there. But Yes Man, Culture Jamming, like the Adbusters crew and, and Callie Lazen wrote a book about culture jamming sort of before the Yes Men were really around. I think those are really kind of good examples. I would say there's judo, which is using the opponent's weaknesses against them, and that's what culture jamming is. Um, there's shifting the ground under their feet, which would be things like getting the Fairness Doctrine back into place, um, which are kind of the state solutions, the, um, the um, getting, busting the trusts, busting the media trusts. Um, so trying to work within, and, and then this is inside outside strategy stuff, so trying to work within the political system to make it be so that their domination media system can break up. And then all, at the same time though, um, developing an outside media system um, and the, um, what I have to say about the Northern Sun News and basically the anti-war move, uh, the Viet anti-Vietnam Vietnam War movement, um, the media system happened because of the movement and the movement was supported by the media system. And so um, the reason that Occupy got stepped on so hard is because they wanted to prevent the movement from happening. Because you need that kind of virtuous cycle going as well. But yeah, inside game, outside game, and use the opponent's strength and stupidity against them. Um, I was just, uh, one other quick thing was just that they're like, at the very beginning, like Occupy wouldn't, didn't get any press at all, and it was only just kind of our live streams and stuff that were like, pushing it out to the world. But then there was also sort of a bit of a honeymoon period with the media, and it was, seemed like everyone was sort of acting in reference to Occupy one way or another, even if they were, you know, pointing the finger at it saying, that's bad. They were still put in the position of needing to, uh, in order to stay relevant, they had to say something about it. And so uh, putting your sort of square adversaries in the position where they have to do something in order to remain relevant, that is one of the key things that if you can pull that off is, is really crucial. Yeah, I, I just want to say that this is maybe not correct to media, but um, when we talk about this uh, culture jamming, it brings to mind Code Pink, it brings to mind uh, Veterans for Peace, it brings to mind Improv, I don't know if people know what improv is, but they do a lot of cultural things. But people who are concerned about social justice can use improv. In fact, there was a, a freeze-in at uh, Union Station. And Bruce Berry, if some of you know him, he was one of the people in there. Anne Wright was in there. I watched that video of that. And I go, whoa, oh, I know that. I, I know it. So that's cool. But then another thing is a lot of us have done, like at the RNC, time uh, Colleen and others uh, in the peace movement here, we, we had uh, a bunch of banners up on like six different overpasses for two hours each morning. And so that was a way to communicate as a, you, know, you can use billboards, that costs a lot of money, but this was a way to get some exposure. But of course then in order to really get it on, you have to use the other tools, which are the film, the video, the internet to try to expose it. But we, we try to do things like that. We, we, had a, we made a, a snow pyramid in front of the Capitol on St. Paul one, one time. And uh, it was kind of controversial because we didn't really have permission for it. And uh, I remember Colleen was talking to the lady, who, Ann, who's in charge of the Capitol there for, for a half an hour. And we had all these police out there. I said, Colleen, are we gonna get arrested? And she said, I don't know. But we didn't, and we got our video online on the internet, so if anybody wants to see that one, you just go, Google for uh, Snow Pyramid in St. Paul. And I do believe, of course, it's on WAM today. 
<laughs> Creativity is the key. Do I get to talk? Yep. Okay. This is kind of a take on what the lady ahead of me said. Um, we can. I hope people are realizing that this is kind of way too much work and way too much frustration in our citizenry. And um, like at, at a town hall meeting in St. Louis Park, where I'm from. There had been a common sense thing that could have been done by our state level legislators and they were having this town hall meeting and I stood up and was kind of wondering why this wasn't done. And one of them, I can't remember which one of the three said, well, we didn't see you and others on the steps of the Capitol. And I thought, that's what they're, they're all kind of lazy and they won't do anything until they see us out there rabble rousing. Uh, they won't even do common sense things. And I thought, there are too many issues. There's education, environment, labor issues, health, social issues, um, communications. I mean, uh, we can't lead our lives if we have to get out there and get groups organized and do all these um, steps. And the citizenry is being exhausted. Mm -hmm. And it's an easy cure, you guys rank choice voting. I mean, I lived in Europe for going on five years and they have like six week elections. And it's very civilized and deep thinking. And I think everybody thinks it's racism just because they're whiter than America is. I mean, I think it's just awful the excuses that are given for this. Now, Mark, you're here, I can buttonhole you. But he said that, um, like was it 1892 that there was that Baker's Manifesto where they said, they're going to make sure that we stay in a two-party system where we're at each other's throats, and then they will literally laugh all the way to the bank. Charles Lindbergh, <laughs> Sr. Okay, what year? It was Baker's Manifesto of 1892, but he right. produced it in 1930. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so we are locked in this just uh, exhausting fight, and truth gets through with, mm -hmm. and you have to have parties. They can do so much organizing. Like, how can, oh, please, everybody, <laughs> right. please. And, and I, I ran on, um, when we got our CV, Frank was born going to Minneapolis, I was observing election sites, and an educational psychologist was one of the judges, he says, now I'm wondering why the government hasn't done this, because a two-point comparison is the most primitive form of human assessment that there is. <laughs> and why they didn't just go up one level to um, ranking one, two, three, and there's many more levels of human sophistication, but we won't even get up to that next step after 200 years. Please, everybody. And, and we have a chance, if, any Demo if there's a flip of one of the houses over in St. Paul, we've got, like somebody said up there, you gotta be ready. We've gotta get ranked choice voting in this state. We'd be the first state, almost, to get it through. John Cole said we're part of the unranked choice voting. Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, that was loud. Um, yeah, and I also think maybe it would be nice if there was proportional representation in the Minnesota Senate or something, so people could pick lists, you know? That's like, part of that. I think that would be great, you know, instead of geographic districts, maybe. Um, and my grandfather was actually in the state legislature for, like, around 30 years, and he hated political parties. Like, he thought the nonpartisan system that used to exist was awesome. It led to things like the foreclosure moratorium in the 30s, because by being kind of a mass that didn't have these choke points of political party structure, right, that the, the banking institutions couldn't prevent the foreclosure moratorium from occurring. And he actually, I found these things he wrote in the State Historical Archives, which was really cool. Um, so, so there's that aspect, but also I think like what I mentioned earlier with open source intelligence and the idea of creating things like an open source intelligence agency, because we have crises in so many different spheres happening in parallel and you never know how to prioritize each one or like what adds up to like a movement versus projects or whatever. If you had ways to just sort of push that information out there to everyone, then that would make everybody have a better decision making processes, better decision making cycles. So that would be a way to get at the horizontal nature of the crisis. And the final thing I would just add that um, a lot of times with like legislators and people, they have sort of a ring of about maybe 15 or 20 people around them that they're kind of like their key advisors or whatever. So if you can kind of find ways to sort of hit those people and then they advise the politician that maybe your path of least resistance is doing something different, like if you can reach those people, um, all of those things can make a little difference. So. Well, I really sensed a really good feeling of the people in this room and so it was a great evening and uh, I think uh, omnipotent Don Olson, Rod Anderson says, 
Throughout the rest of our lives. <laughs> Thank you guys. That was